Well, good evening, folks. If I can call this meeting to order. This evening, we are going to be following two ag or three agendas. We have our special meeting, public hearing under the Planning Act, which is going to deal with an application for a zoning bylaw amendment, Department of Planning and Development Services, report number 2014-79, and the subject is a public meeting report for the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, file number 0090214, and I'm sorry, put my glasses back on. D090214 and D140914, 54 West Side Road. That's going to be followed by our uh, Committee of the Whole meeting, and once again, that will be then uh, followed by our Council meeting, which we hope everything will be ratified that we discuss in committee. So with that, I'm going to call upon Councillor Ron Bodner, who's going to start us off with a prayer, and that will be followed by the National Anthem, being led by Mr. Joel Longfellow. Councillor Bodner. Dear Lord, we ask for your guidance as we meet here tonight. Grant us the wisdom, the wisdom and thoughtfulness to make decisions that will benefit our community. We also ask that you be with the thousands of people that will gather at Remembrance Day ceremonies here and across Canada on November the 11th. Lord, keep the members of our military safe as they strive to bring peace and stability to regions around the world. Amen. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command. Car ton bras se porte le paye, il se porte la croix. Ton histoire est une épopée de plus brillant exploit. God keep our land glorious and free. All Canada, we stand on guard for thee. All Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Thank you, Joel. As always, well done. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of Council and those in the gallery, we're going to start this meeting off uh, this evening, uh, it being Remembrance Day tomorrow. We're going to start off with a short clip that we uh, traditionally play during this time of year here at the Council meeting. Donnie? Good morning, shoppers. At 11 o'clock on this 11th day of November, we'd like to invite you to share with us two minutes of silence. Some died for their homeland. They fought and some died. Now it's our land. Look at his little child. There's no fear in her eyes. Could he not show respect for other dads who have died? Take two minutes, would you mind? It's a pittance of time. For the boys and the girls who went over In peace may they rest May we never forget why they died It's a pittance of time God forgive me for wanting to strike him Give me strength so as not to be like him. My heart pounds in my breast, fingers pressed to my lips. My throat wants to call out, my tongue barely resists. But two minutes I will bide, it's a pittance of time. For the boys and the girls who went over, in peace may they rest, may we never forget why they died. It's a pittance of time. Read the letters 
songs and poems of the heroes at home. They have casualties, battles, and fears of their own. There's a price to be paid if you go, if you stay. Freedom's fought for and won in numerous ways. Take two minutes, would you mind? It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls all over. May we never forget our young become vets at the end. It's a difference of time. It takes courage to fight in your own war. It takes courage to fight someone else's war. Our peacekeepers tell of their own living hell. They bring hope to foreign lands that hate and mongers can't kill. It's a pittance of time for the boys and the girls who go over. In peacetime, our best still don battle dress and lay their lives on the line. It's a pittance of time. In peace, may they rest, lest we forget. Why they died Take a pittance of time Members of council and members of the gallery, tomorrow the city of Brook Holborn will in fact remember. At the cenotaph uh, at 11 o'clock, we will take the opportunity as a community to take that time to remember those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. We will in fact remember the sacrifices that Canadians made to ensure that we today and our communities and throughout the nation are able to enjoy the qualities of life that we are blessed with on a daily basis. We will take the time to remember folks that gave of their time and their life. Folks like Bri Private George Lawrence Price, who was taken by a bullet. Price would, in fact, become the last final Commonwealth soldier and the last of more than 66,000 Canadians to be killed in the First World War. We will, in fact, remember the Canadians who fought in Dieppe, who fought in Normandy, the North Atlantic, Hong Kong, during the liberation of Italy, and in many other important air, sea, and land campaigns during the Second World War. We will, in fact, as a community, remember our Canadian troops who played a crucial role and made a mighty sacrifice in the 1944 D-Day invasion in the Battle of Normandy, a major, major turning point in the war's Atlantic campaign. More than 5,000 were killed in that land invasion in France. We will, once again as a community, remember the Canadian Army who went on to play a significant part in the liberation of the Netherlands which ended in 1945. We will remember that in total, more than one million men and women from Canada and Newfoundland served in the Army, the Air Force, and Navy during the Second World War. More than 47,000, 47,000 did not come home. We will, once again as a community, remember that since the end of the Second World War, Canadians have taken part in dozens of United Nations peacekeeping missions around the globe. We will remember that in Korea, 26,791 Canadians served during a conflict that raged between 1950 and 1953. Most importantly, we as a community will remember how important it is to say thank you. Tomorrow, we remember our nation's past and recognize an inspired nation as Canada continues to preserve the qualities of life that we as Canadians enjoy. Equally as important is how determined our country, Canada, is 
to help those from other countries establish the same values by continuing to have a military involvement in far off places around the world. We recognize and we are inspired by how Canada has and continues to be a positive influence and making a positive difference throughout the world. This is the legacy, folks. This is the legacy of each and every soldier that dons a Canadian flag. I'm extremely proud, extremely proud, as a leader in this community to see our next generation getting more involved. In many ways, over 80 poems were sent to the Legion this week alone to commemorate Remembrance Day by our youth and how important they've recognized it is to simply say thank you. How important it is for us Canadians to remember the people that have served and that continue to serve. How important it is to extend our most heartfelt appreciation to their families. Families, some of which, who also have paid the ultimate sacrifice by losing a family member. And how important it is to say thank you every day, not just one or two days a year. Tomorrow, the city of Port Coburn will, in fact, together as a community, pay tribute to our soldiers who never came home. And we honor the veterans who did. It's my pleasure now to ask Mr. James Van Dillen of the museum, as well as Stephanie Powell Baswick, to come on up and present to council some of the artifacts, as well as you see some of the banners around the council chamber that, that really sends a strong message as a community to once again simply say thank you and recognize those soldiers that have long lost in the past, as well as honoring those soldiers that are with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Through your worship to council, guests, and viewers at home, thanks for inviting us. As you know, 2014 marks the 100th anniversary of the beginning of World War I. The museum reached out to members of the community to help share our local story. We are thankful to people who have loaned the Port Coburn Historical and Marine Museum personal effects of soldiers and families of Humberston and Port Coburn to create the exhibit from the home front to the front line. This exhibit focuses on first-hand experiences of our citizens, both at home and on military service, and tells their stories through artifacts, documents, and photographs. Scale models of both the military ships named for our communities the HMCS Humberston and Port Coburn, are also on display next to other military vessels in the Warships exhibit, which opened in July in the Marine Exhibit Museum, or Lighthouse on the museum grounds. In addition, our community is fortunate to have the traveling exhibit from the Archives of Ontario called Dear Sadie, Lives, or Loves, Lives, and Remembrances from Ontario's First World War. And as the mayor mentioned, the panels are up here in council chambers. Telling the stories of four diverse Ontarians, this exhibit highlights the impact the war had on individuals' lives. It features a love story told through letters between a soldier and his sweetheart, the heartwarming correspondence between a frontline surgeon and the patients whose lives he saved, and the remembrances of a veteran who returned to the battlefield some 20 years later. These three ex exhibitions will be open free of charge, 12 to 5 daily, from Remembrance Day tomorrow until November the 28th at the Port Coburn Museum, 280 King Street. We welcome you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, James. Stephanie? Just here if there are any questions. Members of Council, any questions or comments? It was an honour to work with the community on this exhibit, and I know that uh, Michelle Mason, the Assistant Curator, uh, put on quite an impressive exhibit. So if any of you haven't been yet, I do urge you to come out and, and enjoy your community museum. Thanks, Steph, and thanks, James. And it is quite an exhibit. Members of Council, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of our youth are, in fact, getting involved uh, year after year, more so uh, this year than ever. And we were blessed with, with uh, uh, many poems and, and many stories and pictures and drawings and paintings that, uh, that adorn the, uh, the Legion Hall today. Uh, one individual I, I do want to recognize, and, and as you know, we have three different events that happen within the community. Today I was at Northland Point as well as Porto Village, where I read two separate poems. Uh, and although it's hard to pick only three, uh, I did. And I, I read one at Northland Point, one at Porto Village. I'm going to be reading one tomorrow at the Cenotaph. And I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Elliott uh, to read the poem I'm going to be reading tomorrow at the Cenotaph by a young lady by the name of Haley Acaster. 
uh, a young lady from Lakeshore Catholic who uh, submitted uh, just a, a wonderful uh, paper on her thoughts of Remembrance Day. Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for the privilege of reading this. Uh, I've just quickly gone over it, so if I don't get it right the first time, just bear with me. The poem is entitled to Remember Them. In a field full of red flowers they lay, once in a war fighting for their own lives, a soldier saves another one and dies. In Flanders' field the poppies blow, they say, that's only once a year on that very day. At 11 in the morning we stand and give them silence with hearts near our hands, yet we, on, yet we do this only once every year. Just one poppy a year is not enough, for they should remember every day. And for what they have done in every way, they've done so much when we've done little. So let's remember everything they've done, not just once every year, but every day. Haley A. Kester. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Members of Council, we're now going to move on to the, uh, to the special meeting of Council. If I can ask a member to put a motion forward to confirm the agenda, please. Councillor Elliott, Councillor Doucette, are there any questions or comments to that motion? All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Are there any disclosures of interest? Disclosures of interest? With none, we'll move on to the public hearing under the Planning Act. Application for Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Department of Planning and Development, Report Number 2014-79. The subject, Public Meeting Report for an Official Plan and Zoning Bylaw Amendment, File Number D09-0214 D and D140914, 54 West Side Road. Shannon, welcome. Yes, Mr. Mayor. The floor is yours. Thank you. The purpose of this meeting, pursuant to sections 22 and 34 of the Planning Act, is to consider applications submitted by 1898386, Ontario Limited, to amend the City of Port Colborne zoning bylaw and official plan for a property known as 54 West Side Road, the former West Side Arena. The zoning of the property is proposed to be changed from the public and park zone to a site-specific P zone, which would allow the use of the property for mini storage, a warehouse, trade shows, farmer's market, flea market, vehicle sales, and an auditorium within the existing building. The zoning change will also allow a reduced parking requirement for the auditorium use. The applicant also proposes to add a special policy to the parks and open space designation in the official plan to support the uses of the property that were already mentioned. Notice of public meeting was administered in accordance with sections 22 and 34 of the Planning Act and Ontario Regulations 543 and 546, 2006. The notice of public meeting was mailed to property owners within 120 meters of the property. Two notices were posted on the property and a notice was also posted on the city's website on October 21st. At this time, no comments have been received from any members of the public. However, the following comments were received from agencies. From Canadian Niagara Power, there were no issues. From engineering and operations, there were no adverse comments. From the Niagara region, they advised that owners of commercial and industrial buildings are required to comply with the region's sewer use bylaw, which regulates discharges to sanitary and storm sewer systems. This requires the owner to install and maintain a suitable access point, a manhole, to allow observation and sampling um, of the sewage therein. The owner may also be required to install an interceptor to prevent foreign substances from entering the sewer system. Regional staff can provide further information on that. Regional staff had no objection to approval of the applications from a provincial and regional perspective, subject to local planning requirements, as well as, as, well as the comments about the manhole. The procedure to be followed this evening will be to present the report Planning and Development Public Hearing Report 2014-79 to hear any comments from the applicant, receive questions of clarification from Council to the, to the applicant or planning staff, to open the meeting to the public for comments and questions, to announce the requirements under the Planning Act for written notice of passage of the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendments, 
and a brief explanation of future meetings about the applications. At this time, I'd like to present the report. As mentioned earlier, the zoning will allow the property be, to be used for mini storage, a warehouse with outdoor storage, trade shows, a farmer's market, a flea market, vehicle sales, and an auditorium within the existing building. The draft official plan amendment is attached to the report as Appendix A, and the draft zoning bylaw amendment is attached to the report as Appendix B. Council will, re will recall that at its November 12th, 2013 meeting, it agreed to enter into an agreement with Port Colborne Yacht Harbour and Marine for the purchase of this property. And at this time, the, o the owner has submitted the proposed zoning and official plan amendments so that he can use the property the way that he wishes. The City of Port Colborne official plan designates the property as parks and open space. Land use and uses in the parks and open space designation include public landscaped open space, playgrounds and sports fields not administered by a school board, cultural and recreational facilities such as arenas, museums, halls, swimming pools, docks and publicly operated golf courses, linear parks and public open spaces such as multi-use trails and pathways and on-road bicycle routes. The property is currently zoned P, public and park. The P zone permits an auditorium, a public day nursery, a public park, a school, and any public use. The adjacent lands to the north, south, east, and west are all zoned P, public and park, and contain a tennis club, parks, a school, the public works building, and the regional pumping stations. Land to the, lands to the south east and the west are also zoned R2 and R1 and contain residential dwellings. This now concludes the presentation of the report 2014-79. The zoning bylaw amendment will allow the use of the property for the uses that were described and are on this slide. At this time, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to invite the applicant to comment. Thank you, Shannon. Well done. Does the applicant wish to comment? Well, that was a short answer, Ross. <laughs> Ross, welcome. Thank you. Uh, the, what we're planning on doing with the arena is, is turning it into mini storage and storage inside. A long-term plan and storage outside for the boats and so on. Boats, trailers, uh, RVs. A long-term plan, I'm hoping to be able to uh, possibly draw in shows. I've talked to Dave D'Amico at... Uh, Dave Shevolds and Wellen about bringing cars in and doing some shows here. I'd like to see some RV shows, possibly off in the future, uh, bringing in some auctions like they have in, in uh, the Barry area. Uh, I think we could probably do that here with, uh, with RVs and boats and that type of thing. In other words, I'd like to promote that property, which also promotes Port Colman at the same time. I, I think it works together. It's, but it's, a multi-phase plan that's not going to all happen tomorrow we're going to turn them into storage first and then move on from there great thank you Russ thank members you. of council any questions of the applicant with none Ross thank you well done oh I'm sorry councillor Kenny and councillor Butters thank you your worship I, I spoke to uh, Mr. Templin earlier because I was concerned uh, about exactly when the lettering was going to come off that building. Uh, I think that should have come off before we sold it to him, but we didn't do that. So, And he tells me that is going to happen, but maybe not um, as soon as uh, we wanted. And also, just a question through you to the applicant. When you say outside storage, just how much storage uh, is going to be on the outside of that? Of that uh, one, of the, one of the open future. Yeah. We're hoping for that type of thing. Um, Ross, can you, can you come on up to the podium, please? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No problem. We, we would like to, to uh, continue on the way we are downtown. We'll have, hopefully, we can get a car business going over there as well and, and get things going in that fashion. But we're, that's what we're looking at outside right now. Okay. Yes, At the present time, there, there really isn't a need for it. We, we've right. got enough space inside. Yeah, this yeah, is right. this is in the future. In the future. Thank you very much. 
Okay. That's it. Thank, thank you. you, Councilor. Councilor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to either Shannon or Mr. Templin. Um, th in the report, it says to um, about the reduction of parking spaces as it pertains to the auditorium. So I was wondering what that reduction looks like. If you could clarify, um, clarify that for me. Please. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Butters. Uh, currently, there is approximately uh, 97 parking spaces required for the site, and there are presently 72 being provided. So it would be not a very significant reduction, um, but it's something that we can provide more deal detail on in the recommendation report. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions, Councillor Elliott? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you, because Shannon's right here right now, and you said that. And the proponent has said that he wants to turn it into storage inside and out. Um, you're talking about a reduction of about 27 park, 22 parking spaces, 94 to 72, whatever. How do you propose to have outdoor storage in the front of the building, taking up more parking spots? And then I'm assuming you're going to have a trade show on the inside. So if you're already reduced by 22 parking spots, then all the outdoor storage takes effect. That eliminates all the parking. So where are any parking spots going to be should there be a trade show taking place? Mr. Champlain. When we get to the point where there would be shows, that, that's a ways down the road. I think at that point we're not looking at storage outside and we're probably not looking at storage inside. We're going to do shows inside. That's a different ball game. The mini storage will definitely always be there. Uh, I would like to promote it into to boat shows and RV shows. I'm not sure at this point. I, I'm, I'm not going to do the promotion myself. We need proper promoters to come in and do it. And if they feel the venue in Park Holborn is the place where they want to be, cost reasons or whatever, then we'll get it here. If not, I have to look at where I can go in, at, at the present. And the present is I need the storage space. I can, I can use that now. Thank you. And I'd like to, if I can, with the parking, the ball diamond is to the north of me. I would hope there's quite a little parking in there that should we ever get to that point and we did get shows, we could probably work a deal with the city where we might be able to use some of that empty space. That's good. Great. Thanks, Russ. Further questions or comments, members? Are there any questions or comments to staff? With none, Shannon, back to you. Before opening the meeting to the public, I would like to read the following. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Port Colburn before the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment are approved, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the City of Port Colburn to the Ontario Municipal Board. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Port Colburn before the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment are approved, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Municipal Board unless in the opinion of the board there are reasonable grounds to add the person or public body as a party. Any interested members of the public, if I might draw your attention to the back of the room, there is a sign-in sheet to request future notices of, the, of these applications. This time, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to invite any members of the public who wish to speak to the applications to do so. Thank you, Shannon. Are there any members of the public to speak on this? Questions, comments? With none, Shannon? Oh, we do have one. If you just want to come on up and state your name and your address, and the floor is all yours. All you have to do is just press that gray button there, and you're, and you're live. I'm, there you go. Yeah. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. My name is Branka Slamaslik. My address is 614 Stanley Street in Port Colburn. Uh, I'm concerned because we have a couple of lots off at the back of uh, Oakwood Street and off right away on uh, Helen Street, off the Helen Street. And I'm a little bit concerned about this outdoor storage and um, I would hate to see a, 
mess out there. I will, you know, it, the way it looks right now is very nice. I, you know, I have no problem with warehouse storage, but I don't know what's going to happen outside. And I have a concern, and um, uh, especially when uh, if you're driving to Welland and uh, just close to Broadway Street, if you're coming from Perkoban, it's a shame the way Welland City has allowed that uh, one side to your right side uh, where the is total mess in that property, and when you're looking, it's. I would I would hate to see something like that happen to Port Coburn, and off the west side route. Thank you. So I have a concern with that. Okay, members of council, any questions or comments to the presenter? There's none. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Appreciate your time this evening. Shannon, do you want to make any comment on this, on that, with respect to site plan? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the presenter, uh, planning staff will uh, be evaluating any impacts related to aesthetics. Um, if there were to be mini storage units constructed outside, the property would be subject to site plan control, and at that point, we could require fencing and landscaping and all of those types of things to mitigate any um, aesthetic impacts. Um, however, we will do a full analysis in the recommendation report of all of the uses that are proposed, and that will include parking um, and exactly how that might impact the site and and the roadways around it and the neighboring properties thank you Shannon are there any further comments or questions from members of the public with none Shannon it's back to you if you wish to be notified of the approval of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments you must make a written request to the clerk only those persons and public bodies that give the clerk a written request for the notice of the adoption and passing of an official plan and zoning bylaw amendment will be given notice. This concludes the public hearing under the Planning Act. The proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendments will be placed on Council's agenda at a future meeting. Great. Great job, Shannon. Thank you. Members of the public, uh, this does conclude this portion of tonight's agenda. Uh, I will take a one minute to two minute recess just uh, in case some of you folks want to leave, but you're more than welcome to stay. Once again, Shannon, great job. Members, if I can get a motion to adjourn the, that portion of the meeting, please. Doucette, Elliott, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. We'll now move on to our Committee of the Whole portion of tonight's agenda. Madam Clerk, are there any addendum items this evening? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. None this evening. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, members of Council, if I can have a motion to confirm the agenda, please. Councillor Danch, Councillor Bodner, questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Disclosures of interest. Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. I have a pecuniary interest in uh, item number nine as I provided the uh, opinion of value for that uh, said property. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Members of Council, if I can uh, ask if you have any items you want to see lifted on tonight's agenda, please. I have Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Number one. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, item number nine for Councillor Elliott's conflict and item number eight. Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I want to speak to one, two, four, five, eight. <laughs> Do we have anything left to vote on? <laughs> there isn't going to be much left. Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to speak to item number seven and uh, probably speak to one as well. Councillor Elliott. Half time looks pretty good. <laughs> 12 and 15. Thank you, Councillor. So, yes. Members, any further items that you require to be lifted this evening? So we have item three left. We have item six. Item 10. Item 11. Item 13. Item 14. And then from 16 on until 22, which are correspondence and outside resolutions. We're good? Okay, if I can entertain a motion that would accept the remainder of the items. Councillor Demeray. Seconder, please.
Councillor Elliott, questions or comments to that? All those in favour? Opposed? That would be carried. We'll now move on to Regional Councillor Barrick has given his regrets. Is there any or are there any Regional Council items? With none, move on to Councillor's items, new business. Councillor Bodner, Doucette, Steele. Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to um, let everybody know that uh, Councillor Butters and I will be attending uh, Remem Remembrance Day ceremonies at Centennial Park. Um, it's a smaller um, event uh, than the one at H.H. Knoll Park, but uh, very important. Uh, there's on the cenotaph there, there are some 200 names of uh, people that from Hummerson Township that uh, were involved in the First World, the Second World War, and the Korean War. And um, celebration uh, is for families that attend there that actually have people that uh, have served um, the military and some that didn't return. And after the uh, ceremony, we go back to St. John's Lutheran Church for a lunch and some fellowship. And uh, it's a very nice gathering. And uh, Councilor Butters and I are happy to attend on behalf of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I've got a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, through you to Mr. Hansen. Mr. Hansen and I. Uh, have already discussed this, but I want some timelines, and it has to do with the water that is leaking from the roof of the Valley Health and Wellness Center. Last winter was horrible. There were pails everywhere, and I was promised last winter it would be fixed. In speaking with Mr. Hansen the other day, he said there's engineering, there's a whole bunch, there's the architect, a lot of people are involved in fixing the issue. And they, they, they think they know what it is, but I want timelines because I've been back exercising since, I, since the election. And every day I walk in, there's a pail there, and almost every day there's water in it, sitting right by as you walk into the exercise room. I want to know when it's going to be fixed. I want timelines of some kind so that during the, during the winter this year, when I go there every day, I don't have to face a bunch of pails sitting in the exercise room and the gyms. Thank you, Councillor. And that's what happened last year. Mr. Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As I explained to Councillor Doucette, it's an issue we're working on. We've been working on it ever since any leaks appeared on the system. Um, the roofing contractor has been involved. We have a maintenance contractor looking at it as well. There are many issues that aren't easy to pin down in terms of the, uh, the eave troughs on it, the scuppers that are in there. There's a a heat trace system uh, on the um, roof itself that moves the ice during the winter months. We had a very cold winter last year. The heat trace system failed in a couple locations. Uh, there was no sensors. The sensors themselves do not give you a, a, an alarm warning when they have failed, so it's very difficult uh, to find out where those failures are with the heat trace system. Uh, there's leakage around some of the troughs that are in there. Um, Unfortunately, with roof leaks and a roof that size, uh, the leaks show up in different areas. Um, there's an issue with the uh, collection of the water off the roof where the uh, catch basin type grates that are on the roof, they were falling up quite quickly with leaves and debris, even though we cleaned them one day, when the wind comes up, they were, they were blocked again. So there's many, many issues that are being dealt with. We're dealing through the general contractor through maintenance items uh, we've had our experts up there taking a look at it. They're making recommendations. Also, the architects are looking at the roof system itself to see if they can find some solutions to it. In the interim, I can't give you a timeline. There is no timeline. It's something that's being actively worked on, uh, pursued by everybody that's worked on the roof itself. Nobody wants to see leaks in the roof, but unfortunately, they are there, and we're trying to find solutions to them, and we're working we can assure council we're working very actively to try to find those leaks. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Councillor? <clears throat> okay, then that means that every time I walk in there and there are pails everywhere, I'll have to explain to everyone that we're working on it, and which is what I did last, last winter, okay? And it's a great facility, don't get me wrong, okay? 
But this is something that people have been talking about ever since we've opened the center. Okay, let's be honest here. Um, and and there's, there has to be some timeline. Someone has to have an idea as to when we can get this done. Because if, if it gets, starts getting really cold, then we won't be able to go back up on the, on the roof again. So that means we're going to spend a whole winter of thaw and freeze cycles where we're going to be putting out pails all over the place again. And, and I think it's someone's got to have a, a solution somewhere. And it's got to happen. Let's make sure it's the right one. And I agree with Mr. Hansen. Let's make sure it's the correct one. And maybe it'll take a little bit longer. But all, what I'm being told is I'm going to have to tell everyone for most of this winter is we're working on it. Mr. Hansen. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Doucette doesn't really have to speak to this to the public. The public are, are we're, we're keeping the YMC involved. They're, they're active partners with us on this. Uh, they're tenants. We're all active partners. We're working very hard at, at trying to resolve this solution. The pills are there, uh, but it's just leaking right now. And, there, and we found many solutions to it. Many repairs have been done on the roof. Uh, there was ice damage uh, during the first winter. That was repaired, and leaks showed in other areas. So it's not an easy solution. If I could give you a timeline, if there was an easy solution, we would have had it fixed by now, but it's not easy. So. We have to keep addressing the issue uh, with the contractor and try to ensure that uh, these things get fixed. And that's the best we can do at this point. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Next issue. Next issue would be the there is there are some 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 members of the Legion that have indicated to me that there is a sign that is appears to be missing coming into Port Coburn from the west on Highway 3. I gather from the east there's a Legion sign that says the Legion goes and t sort of indicates which way to go. The one on the west seems to be missing. Uh, they were just wondering if that could be looked at and uh, hopefully they're correct on that. But, you know, okay. um, that they, they, they would like to have that checked and I'm sure Mr. Hansen will have that done and I'm not worried about that part of it. Okay. the. The other issue that I received, and I've received quite a few calls, is that at one point during one, I believe, of the federal elections, someone indicated that maybe there was a way for seniors to pay a little less taxes. Um, I don't know if we as a city council can send something out. There are seniors out there suffering because of the, t the whole tax system. And I'm not talking about only our tax system. And it, it is what it is, and they understand that. But they are looking to find a way to have some relief if they are seniors and they are having trouble living in their homes. I don't know what the process is, and I don't know if we should send a letter out to the federal or provincial offices. Um, and I, I'm going to need guidance on that, but I indicated to the people that called me about it that I would bring it to council and see what council thought of it, and maybe there's an, there would be a need for a motion or something that would indicate that we would send a letter to the MP and the MPP and so on to look at a way of giving seniors relief in some way, shape, or form. I don't know what shape that can take, but they asked me to do it, I'm here, and I'm doing it. Thank it's, you, Councilor. Okay. That's great. I'm going to ask Mr. Sinez to comment, and what I would suggest after his comments, Councilor, you give some thought to putting an order as a motion forward. Okay. With respect to giving Council or asking Council for some direction for staff to take. Okay. And of course, to be entertained at the next Council meeting. Yep. Mr. Sinez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, three to Councilor Doucette. With regard to property taxes, uh, it's basically covered uh, under the Municipal Act. It's legislated on the, under the Municipal Act, as you know. Um, there are, there's only reliefs for vacancies, charity rebates, heritage rebates. There are no specific um, rebates for, for seniors. The only thing that I can suggest is the property taxes are based on assessment and that possibly um, anybody that is looking and feels that their assessment is possibly too high that they look at um, appealing their assessment to the uh, MPAC and uh, look at to see whether or not their assessment 
can be reduced. If the assessment is, can be reduced because it, it maybe it's, it's overvalued on their property, then obviously the, the property taxes do go down. Other than that, it's a matter of, um, of um, um, you know, sending something off to the province as to whether or not they can put something through the municipal act for some type of uh, seniors um, rebates or credits or, or uh, something of that respect. But it would have to come through the province to change something in the municipal act to give us the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Mr. Sinez. Councilor? One last one. Councilor, before you, before you depart yep. from that, uh, one of the thoughts that you may want to consider in mm -hmm. your motion, in your notice of motion, mm -hmm. uh, and although we do, as Mr. Sinez correctly pointed out, are governed under the Municipal Act uh, with respect to market value, et cetera, uh, part of that motion you may want to consider is, is to look at age versus just property class, mm -hmm. and to in fact look at the possibility of, of, uh, of offering relief to those uh, over a certain age and or uh, a certain level of, in of income or lack thereof. So it's something you may want to consider to pass yep. on to the, to the province and, and or the federal government. Yeah, both. Uh, yep. So that therefore they can consider giving some relief in some other form versus just under market value. Yeah, okay, okay. great. Thank you for that. The last one is one that I've been debating about for the past couple of weeks. Uh, whether I want to or not, I'm not sure. But I will say this. I'm grateful to the fact that Park Homer and Wayfleet newspaper is here. I am totally disappointed in the fact that a lot of the newspaper media have done almost nothing in covering Park Homer and some of the southern cities that are down here. It's as if we don't exist. And, I, and, and, and I, I'm disappointed and upset at the same time, and I've had other people talk to me about it, and I thought I'd bring it up. Where are they? They used to be here all the time. And I remember, and I know for a fact, that Coleman Bagu must be rolling in his grave right now because he warned us of that way back when, when the Port Coburn section was taken out of the newspaper, he said, wait, wait, you guys, you guys are not even going to exist in the newspaper if you guys do this and you allow it. We didn't all have that much choice, but it went on. And what he was talking about is now happening. It's as if we don't exist in a lot of cases. There's the odd little tidbit that comes out, but that's all it is. It's a little odd tidbit. And I'm disappointed in the newspaper media. I'm disappointed in the two main newspapers that supposedly are covering this area. They don't. Thank God we have Heidi. She's done a lot of things for Port Coburn in this area, and she's put a lot of papers in. There's also the Erie, Erie Media. He's done a, quite, a, quite a few things as well along the South Shore. We didn't have them. We probably would have no coverage of any kind with the whole South Shore area. I'm very disappointed, and I thought I'd put that out. Like I said, I've been debating whether I was going to or not, but I think it's important to put it out there. If they want us to buy their newspapers, they've got to put something in there that talks about us. Otherwise, why would we buy it? Why would we even bother? And that's where it's come down to for me. So you, anyway, Councilor. just a comment. Thank you, Councilor Doucette. Councillor Butters. Thank you. I'm just going to add to that. We've always traditionally put all the advertisements in for the committees that come up this time of year for um, uh, citizens um, when that's all renewed in the new term. We should maybe think about um, putting it in on the online newspaper because they really don't seem to be that interested in covering here physically, that's for sure. So I throw that out there to the acting CAO and... Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kenny, new business. Councillor Demeray, you're good. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Worship. <coughs> I have two items. Uh, first is with regards to, as, as everyone knows, lots have now become available to be built on uh, in the old tunnel swath. A lot of that property we own. Some we don't, but a lot of it we do. So if I could uh, ask Council um, uh, for some direction to, or to give some direction to, Mr. Aquilina to come back at a future date with regards to what is available uh, and also what 
may not be available because I know uh, in the Humboldt, Clark, Wellington area, there are some properties with uh, storm pipes and things like that uh, and speaking to engineering. So some of those lots, even though they look like they could be built on, they, they really can't. However, there are lots around. Um, so if we could uh, ask uh, staff to bring that report back to council so council can take some direction on disposing of uh, surplus properties because of the uh, the tunnel being taken off the books. So if I may, Councillor Steele, before you sit down, if you want to put a motion forward for leave. I'll move uh, for leave. Thank you. Seconder, please. Councillor Elliott, questions or comments to that motion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried? Councillor Steele? I'll move that uh, we direct uh, Mr. Aquilina and his department to come back with a report to council with regards to uh, vacant properties uh, along the old uh, tunnel. Um, highway three corridor. Highway three corridor. Uh, and also probably look at any other properties uh, that have slipped under the radar um, that could be declared surplus that could be sold. Thank you, Councillor Steele. Seconder, please. Councillor Demeray. Are there any questions or comments by members of council? Members of staff, clarification or comments or questions? Mr. Mayor, I've had the discussion with Councillor Steele, and I think we should have a report that talks about all the properties in the yes. City of Port Coburn that could be potentially there for infill development mm -hmm. or other properties that could be um, conveyed to the neighboring property owners under the current policy. So we definitely will bring that report forward. There's a lot of properties. It's a lot of work, but we will bring it forward. One question I have, uh, Mr. Aquilina, is with respect to the properties along the old Highway 3 corridor that are now, as Councillor Steele rightly uh, noted, that are now available for development. Is it in your opinion that the property owners actually recognize that the corridor has been lifted? Mr. Mayor, we, we advertise, we inform the public, but there's a potential that they may not know. They may not know that those lands sit there and now the diversion is lifted. So part of the process, we can inform, inform them. We can market, right. market the properties right. as being potentially available. And that's exactly what I'm getting at. Is at the very least, a, a quick letter off to those folks informing them that the corridor has been lifted and there might be some opportunity for development on those lands. Definitely. Great. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. Questions or comments further, members of Council? Councillor Danch. I just uh, wanted to make one uh, quick shout out there. Uh, St. John's Lutheran is having their uh, church bazaar this uh, weekend. Huh? No? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought, I'm sorry. I'm, oh, I'm done now? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Frank. <laughs> I thought you were going to speak on the actual motion. <laughs> <laughs> to the motion, members of council? No further comments or questions? Member of staff, you're okay? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed, that would be carried. Frank, or uh, Billy, second one, and then I'm, gonna, then I'm coming to you. <laughs> Through your worship, thanks, Frank. <laughs> um, second issue was brought up by a, a resident on West Street uh, who came forward. Um, they, they noticed that we have the permit parking now on Sugarloaf uh, between uh, Steel Street and... Um, and Isabel, uh, they are asking uh, if staff could look at permit parking between Victoria and uh, to approximately Kent. Um, so I guess I need leave again to ask staff to bring something back to council with regards to this. Thank you. Seconder? Councillor Doucette, questions or comments to that motion? All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Councillor Steele. Thank you, Worship. So with regards to that, uh, if we could ask staff uh, to bring a similar report that they did on Sugarloaf Street. Uh, back to council at a future date um, with the, I guess, pros and cons and, and their opinion on uh, permit parking. And it would be on the west side of, of uh, West Street. It wouldn't affect the east canal side of, uh, of uh, West Street. So just on the one side. Thank you, Councillor. Do we have a seconder to that, please? Councillor Elliott. Questions or comments to that? Members of staff, Mr. Hansen or Mr. Aquilina? Through Mr. Mayor, I will have bylaw enforcement write the report for Council's consideration at an up-and-coming Council meeting. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. No further questions or comments? Members of staff, okay. All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Councillor Danch. Okay, we're not on repeat here. <laughs> I'm just going to do a little shout-out for uh, the church I attend. It's St. John's Lutheran's on the corner of uh, Silver Bay Road and Highway 3. They have their uh, church Christmas bazaar. This Saturday from uh, 10 till 2, uh, all are welcomed, uh, light lunch, uh, crafters and whatnot, and I just uh, want to do that because my wife told me I should. Thank you so much. <laughs> Smart move, Frank. <laughs> 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 Members of council, are there any further uh, new business? Councillor's items? Councillor Elliott. Just real quick, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to uh, Mr. Hansen. Uh, we had talked earlier about the, uh, the issue down on Oak Ridge with the... Uh, 
the water main, the um, tiger that's that's running. Um, talked to a couple other people and they had concerns too. Do we know how many dead ends there are total in the city and are they all under the same situation where we're flushing them constantly? Because um, somebody asked me, you know, we've got one here and then they heard that there was another one I can't remember what area it was in. Then you started doing the math and if we're water's running all the time, you know, how much are we, we dumping out because of the situations? But just how many dead ends are there in the city where we have to flush consistently? Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Hanson? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Elliott. Yes, we're aware of all the dead ends, and those are always flagged in the uh, INS study for the water distribution system that we had done. Um, there's a couple issues with the Oak Ridge one, uh, which I can update Council on. We've just uh, updated the water model as part of our INS study. And there's some good news in terms of the uh, dead end mains and the Lakeshore Road uh, West Water Main that's being approved and, and under design now. That's going to tender actually in December. The modeling indicates that with the extension of the um, water main on Lakeshore Road and the connection to the Stanley Clarence Street area, the retention time of that water in Oak Ridge and Lakewood is going to be substantially reduced. And what that means is chlorine residuals are going to be maintained um, in the mains for a longer period of time before they dissipate. Right now the retention times in that area are over 100 hours at, at uh, given periods of time. So the modeling indicates that these, uh, these improvements we're doing with the new trunk water main are substantially going to reduce that problem. Secondly, uh, when we had our discussions about the hydrant and uh, uh, we actually um, gave an order to uh, reduce the hydrant times and not have the hydrants running at night. And subsequent to that, we had an adverse water sample on Lake Crescent immediately after. Whether it was directly linked to that or not, I don't know. But we are going ahead with a, a, an auto flush valve in lieu of the hydrant. The auto flush valve has a, a timing mechanism so we can actually time it, connect it to the sanitary sewer, and then discharge the water at given periods of time. And that, what that does is eliminate the hydrant running. Uh, for a fairly constant period of time because you can't regulate that. So that's going ahead with the auto flush valve and, and as I said, the uh, improvement of the main during the 2015 construction season is going to solve that. The other dead end mains, and we have a number of them, I can think of one on Omer going towards the old Robin Hood mills, we have an auto flush valve on that one, same problem. And there's a num number of the others in the city. So all those are recommended during the uh, capital program for either uh, an upsizing of the mains with PVC or a, a looping of the mains uh, at Rosedale, um, Prosperity Avenue, ones like that. We're going to try to loop those dead end mains that are causing us some problems now. So it's all in the works, but uh, the new model that we have now is uh, able to really predict where these uh, uh, water retention areas are where we're, we're experiencing the low chlorine residuals. So working, working actively on that. Thank you, time. Mr. Hanson. That's good. Members of Council, further? With none? Members of staff? Peter, you look anxious there. <laughs> You're good? <laughs> okay, with that, uh, Members of Council, the last thing I want to say during Council's items, and I, I forgot to say it earlier, is I want to take this opportunity to congratulate the Township of Wainfleet. Uh, as Members of Council do recognize, the Township of Wainfleet for the first year of this year is going to be celebrating uh, Remembrance Day in their township with their new Senate staff. So I, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to congratulate Town Council, Township Council, as well as the community on, uh, on, on getting it built and now having an opportunity as a community to really celebrate Remembrance Day. So kudos to the Township and uh, good on them. So with that, we'll move on, members of Council, to the items listed. Before I go to that, members of staff, any updates you wanted to provide? Besides the leaking roof, <laughs> we'll be easy on your run. <laughs> no updates? Dan, you're all right? No, sir. Okay. We'll move on to item one, Councillor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Department of Fire and Emergency Services report number 2014-6, subject fire department responding to Port Coburn Hospital for medical calls. Recommendations are that the mayor and members of council receive this report for information purposes and further that the appropriate city staff be authorized to request that the current T-1 
tiered response agreement be modified to reflect the recommendation of the medical director. Thank you. Do you have a seconder to that, please? Councillor Bodner, questions or comments? Councillor Sapp. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the chief, possibly, or uh, anyone else that can answer this. I have some concerns with, unless we can replace our fire chief, our, our, our firemen, with, what, what, what I believe they call them P3s, which is the toppest level of uh, paramedics. They are the ones that are usually there before the ambulance. Okay, now, it said, well, there was only one real cardiac arrest, according to the report. Which one of us is prepared to tell that one cardiac person that we can't respond, and if anything happens, we have to wait until these guys show up from wherever? Which one of us is going to do that? I'm not prepared to do that. And I have a concern with not allowing our, our, our people. Now, is there a way that maybe when they call into 911, they can gear it and check it out. I don't know. But maybe, may, maybe the chief can indicate this to me and, and maybe calm me down a bit in, in, in that area, in that, you know, don't worry about it. Everything's cool. We got it under wraps or whatever. Thank you, Councillor. Chief Cartwright. Through your worship to members of council, that's why this report is here tonight. It's not my decision to make. It's yours. Um, I have, I have uh, some of those same concerns, although I, I've got to admit that that was one of the questions I did raise as the report speaks to the fact that in the past we've always found that there's usually somebody taking care of the patient in the hospital, uh, and that report says that. Um, in conjunction with the determination of the medical director who oversees these types of operations, uh, at one point NHS, if they had a, um, an issue, a main issue in, in the hospital, i.e. a heart attack, or stop, a uh, heart were to stop, cardiac arrest, um, they wouldn't let the doctor leave the UCC because they worked under a contract. They, their hands were somewhat tight, as I was told. That didn't sit well with me, so I pushed for the fact that, at least in the hospital, they would get patient care from a medical professional. And what we have found for shortness of breath, usually the nurses and so on, take care of the patients, in particular on the second floor, is where we've got involved with most of these issues. Um, the, uh, the plain and simple truth is I don't argue the point that we get there to the hospital. I can't say 100% of the time, but I'm going to tell you probably 90% of the time. We beat the EMS to medical calls in the city over 60% of the time. So uh, I'm proud to be able to say that, quite frankly. Um, the, the medical director is confident that the, the NHS has changed the system internally that will allow for, to compensate for us not necessarily being there a minute or two earlier than we have been in the past, waiting for EMS. Obviously, if there's a lengthy delay, that can be determined by the EMS dispatcher. Uh, they can contact our dispatcher simultaneously, and then we, we can be sent to the call. If they have a multiple number of uh, issues going on in this particular hospital at any given time, they can tear us out automatically. All that will be taken into consideration if we do, in fact, uh, modify the tiered response agreement. Thank you, Chief. Councilor, further questions, comments? I think I had Councilor Butters on, on the line here. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, we did uh, talk about this in the fire master planning um, sessions. We did go over this, and um, we felt um, pretty confident that as long as the changes were internal to the NHS system, you know, this was um, a doable thing. Um, it doesn't mean that they would never go because there could be times that they, they would be tiered out. But as a general rule, it's, it's, it looks like um, they managed to work out a, a better, a, I would say, a better solution in a lot of ways. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kenny. I'm very happy with the Chief. You're good. <clears throat> Further comments or questions? Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. I guess through you to the Chief. It, it's, I'm a layman. I don't know the fire department and the health service, but it, you know, from looking at it from the outside, and most people, I think, in town would say, why are we dispatching the fire department to the hospital? It really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I guess in your comments, when you say 90% of the time when you get there, the patient has already been administered by either nurses or the doctor in the hospital. And here we are putting our firefighters at risk by rushing them across mm -hmm. the city to go perform 
their service when they've already got somebody looking after them. I would rather have our fire department safe and sound knowing full well that somebody that's in a building where they're supposed to be receiving care anyways is going to get that care without our guys running their truck across town to come and uh, administer first aid to them. So I, I would, you know, put it back in the NHS. Let the NHS look after their building. We'll look after what we're supposed to look after with our guys. We don't mind helping out when we're supposed to and when we can, but it just seems ridiculous to send guys into a situation that's already being looked after. So I would, I would support what the, what the item says and the chief says, uh, you know, let them uh, look after their own and uh, we'll step back from that. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Further questions, comments? Chief, anything further? I just, if I can, Your Worship, uh, just correct one uh, little uh, tidbit of information there. I was saying we get there 90% of the time before EMS, uh, not necessarily staff. They're there 100% of the time before we are. Um, obviously, they're right there taking care of them. Uh, I will say that uh, I haven't agreed with, as you can see from the report, for a number of years with regards to us going to the hospital, especially when, uh, in particular, what angered me a little bit was the fact that we have had a doctor in the hospital within the building who couldn't leave the urgent care area to go and help somebody on the second floor. That, that was a stone that inside me that really bothered me. And I think we won on that situation because there have been some modifications made to their policies. So, thank, thank you. you. For the questions, comments, to the motion, your pleasure. Yep. Councilor Butters, go ahead. I, I just want to commend the chief for, st for sticking with it because um, when we were made aware of this situation within the committee, it, it was like, sh give your head a shake. Um, <laughs> you know, like the easiest common sense thing seemed to be very evasive for um, the NHS for a while. So I'm really give the chief credit for um, being kind of like that little pit bull with a bone. Great job, chief. And I like to give Dr. Doug a, a bit of credit here too, monthly. Uh, I know he's he's went to bat for us as well, so uh, kudos to him. He's I know he works out in Niagara Falls, but he's done a he's done some a yeoman's job at uh, at promoting this this initiative. So with that, members of council, your pleasure to the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Thank you. We'll now move on to item two, Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Worship. Department of Planning and Development. Report number 2014-69, subject request for keeping of chickens within the urban area. That council receives this report for information purposes and that no further action be taken. Do I have a, sec okay. I guess. Do I have a second to that, please? Councillor Butters. Questions or comments? Councillor Kenny. I pulled the item, uh, your worship, as I believe one of the delegation, people who are from a delegation are here this evening and would like to speak to the issue. Um, I, at least Leslie's here. Yeah, okay, so if, let, if we would allow her, please, uh, to come to the podium. Thank you, Councillor. If I can ask for leave, please, Councillor Kenny, Councillor Demaray. Questions or comments? All in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. To the motion that Councillor Kenny is putting on the floor to allow the delegation to speak on this report, moved by Councillor Kenny, seconded by Councillor Steele. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Come on up. just want to state your name and your address and the floor is all, all yours. Hello, my name is Leslie Butt. I live at 231 Charlotte Street in Port Coburn. Um, I'm not really sure where to begin because I've never really done this before. <laughs> um, I was kind of shocked that there was no speak of a yes or a no that you were, it was just going to stay, the bylaw was going to remain the way it was. I, you, you made comments about no media coming to Port Coburn. This was something the media was talking about. This is something that we had two stories written about. This is something that would draw attention to Port Coburn. Welland hasn't done it yet. We could be one of the forefronts to start changing some of these bylaws. This is a bylaw that is near and dear to us because we do believe that we have a right to choose where our food is coming from and this is something that we've done in the past and had no problems with. The only reason why we had a problem this time was because a neighbor didn't even complain from what we understand. 
she just brought it to the attention of the city that we had chickens and we're breaking a bylaw. Chickens, backyard chickens have better egg production. They're healthier eggs. They're better for you. I can give you lists of why they're better for you if you like. As well, um, the Tribune did an online poll. The poll last time I checked was 61% were in favor of allowing backyard chickens. And um, there was, I think it was 20% was no, and then the rest were maybes and I don't knows and I don't cares. We haven't had any complaints. They're healthy. It's not like keeping, um, it wouldn't be any different than feeding birds outside than it would be for us to have chickens. It's not going to bring any more predators into Port Coburn, such as foxes or what have you, than it would for someone feeding birds outside in a bird feeder. So I'm not sure why we're not looking into this any further and why it stopped here. Great, thank you, Leslie. Before you get off the podium, members of council, are there any questions or comments? Councillor Butters. Well, I have one. Maybe I'll end up with two, I don't know. But um, I want to know what do you do with uh, chicken manure? You can use it as compost. We were buying um, organic chicken feed, and if you're feeding your chickens scraps from vegetables and such from your own garden, then it's all organic, and it can be placed back into the soil. And it's not unhealthy. It's actually good for the soil. Councilor? So that's, that's great for somebody like yourself who's, who's prepared to do that, but um, I guess my concern would be... Councilor, if we can stick to questions for now until we get to the report. Well... It, it does tie into like the okay, disposal of fine. manure. So in the broader sense, that would be my concern for okay. others, perhaps not yourself, but for others. That's fine. <laughs> this is, is questions to the presenter. Go ahead. Can I just comment to that for a second? In, in a second. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Kenny. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, um, along with the, the report, uh, we got, um, I guess it's, top 10 list of chores for people keeping and that's what was my question was about the chicken manure as well because this is from the um, farmer egg farmers of Ontario and it says it is not appropriate not appropriate to compost chicken manure to the high level of minerals especially phosphorus in the manure which can stop the composting process in a typical backyard composter so we got this information, like, that was one of the, the reasons. So I'm just asking, this is great for you, but for, for us, we have to look at it as? Well, first of all, I mean, there's not many people here looking to fight it, it and keep it the way it is. Mm -hmm. And there's not many people here looking to have them either. I'm the only one standing here. So, and I know there's more people in Port Corbin that do have chickens other than us as well. And of course, they're not gonna come forward and support us because if they do, then they could lose their chickens as well. So I don't know if I necessarily agree with everything that they said. There are other cities in our area, Niagara Falls, that does allow backyard chickens, and they are more than willing to come and speak to members of council on how they moved forward to change their bylaws and what they're doing with feces, feed, all that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. You wanted to make a comment as well? Um, yes, um, actually, same thing with feces, the dog food, dogs, other animals, it's the same thing. We're all disposing of some sort of animal feces. It's all around town, it's, every animal has it. So it's, I don't think that that's a huge concern other than containing it. So it's not, you know, smelling, so neighbors aren't complaining of any odor. But other than that, I don't see it being an issue over the benefits of having backyard chickens. Okay, Councilor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you too, Ms. Butt. Um, I, I have heard some complaints from your neighbors and I just would like oh, okay. two, two issues addressed. Sure. One being the smell from the manure. Uh, are you, what do you plan to do to address that? Because we never one heard that has a, a complaint there. Of the smell of manure? Smell they had a, manure. a complaint of it. Yeah, well, chicken manure is kind of distinct. It's a little different than- I don't know how others. it was so clean. I, I, I understand their, their complaint, but- uh, I don't, because it was cleaned daily. Well, all right, but so uh, and I mean they're not here to speak daily, of it. What are you doing with it when you when you clean it? Well, what we cleaned it out and we had it in a bag and we threw it in the garbage. Okay. 
so you're not we're we haven't composted yet because we didn't get to that stage. They were only outside for a month before anything happened. So I'm really surprised that there was any complaint of actual odor. They were still babies. Okay. Uh, the other complaint was about noise. Um, uh, we did have one. Hold we on, did on, have hold one hold rooster hold that on, was removed. Hold on, hold on, hold on oh, sorry. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on here. I let you go for a bit, but it's getting carried away now. <laughs> no, I just want to okay. know what she would do. Ask the question sorry. to me, <laughs> and you have to wait till she asks the okay. question before you answer it. Okay. okay. <laughs> if I may. Okay. Good. okay. Thanks, ladies. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Through you to Ms. Bud again. Um, as far as the noise go, in, in, in particular early morning noise, um, what can you do to address that? Actually, um, our problem was one of our chickens we all thought were hens was not. One was a rooster. Mm -hmm. So that would not have been something we would have kept on the property. And I think that should be part of the bylaw amendment that there be no roosters because that is a nuisance and I totally agree. It bothered us and we would have had them removed anyways. So okay. absolutely. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Leslie. Thank you, Councillor uh, Demaray. Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Through you to uh, Leslie. Um, two questions. One, sure. um, should this uh, bylaw amendment be approved? What's the numbers you're looking for to uh, keep on your property? Well, I think a reasonable amount would be four to five. I don't see there being a need for more than that. I mean, depending on someone's family size, four chickens is more than enough to feed as far as egg consumption goes. So I don't think you need more than four or five. Great. Thank you. Councilor? Second question. Um, you keep promoting that Niagara Falls has a bylaw that says they get to keep 10. Uh, there was a couple other cities that are um, stated in the report that they have bylaws that allow some. There seems to be more cities absent from the list than there is on the list that allow them. What do you say about the cities that don't allow them? There there's, seems to be less that I think allow that's, them that, that don't. <laughs> I, think, I think that's changing. <laughs> I think this is part of a trend of people starting to care more about where their food is coming from. So I think this is just the beginning. So I think it's something that Port Coburn can choose to be in the forefront of or something that we follow in pursuit later. I don't think it's a matter of it happening or not. It's just a matter of when and which council is going to go for it. And I'm not saying that the next one, it could be the third or the fourth council that comes in, but it will happen, I believe. I think we care about our food. I think it's starting to happen now. More gardens are coming up in, in backyards. People are caring. Thank you, Leslie. Council? Real quick, and I, and I understand your position on it. Um, well, what about your neighbors? I guess that's, that's what probably our biggest concern is. I understand where you're coming from for natural foods and controlling what you eat and where you get your food from. But in our position, there's already been a couple of examples where animals are being kept inside the urban area. Um, where it's been put out that in order to keep them, you have to have 100% agreement from your neighbors. If one neighbor says no, then it's no. Your point of view on that, and would that be acceptable to you if you could get all your neighbors to buy in? Because the, th the thing I guess that we're looking at and we have to take into consideration is you're promoting it as you're gonna do everything the right way. And I can understand that because you're gonna stand here and you're gonna tell us you're gonna do everything perfect but the next person might not. And that's what we have to consider. So I'd like to take, have your perspective on that where the zoning bylaw amendment is blanketed throughout the city and while you can provide great care and look after them, there are some people that won't. As you say about dogs, where some dogs are a nuisance and other people don't have a problem with their dogs, we have to take into consideration everybody that's gonna be affected by it. Some might not. Some might not like it, and yet you have to take in the broader perspective of what's good for everybody and not just a few, and, and that's, that's the point that me, personally, I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, if you can keep it clean and you can keep them quiet and there's no roosters, because five <laughs> o'clock in the morning comes pretty early, but it's, it's basically, you know, we let you do it and it works out perfectly, but then there's two or three other people down the road where we have the issues and how do you control all that. So your opinion on that, because it's such a broad based bylaw throughout the city that you can do it everywhere. Um, I'd just like to know your opinion on how are you gonna do it so that everybody is appeased by it and everybody gets along. That's a great question, Councillor. 
Leslie? Okay, what I think is that's something that you'd have to put in the bylaw. There should be rules on how food should be kept so that you're not attracting rodents or anything of that nature. There should be rules on what you're going to do with the feces. If you guys decide that it's not appropriate to be keeping it as compost because there could be odors related to it, then proper disposal of it. It's like you said, the same thing with having a dog. We're allowed to have dogs. And we can complain about the barking dog, but the neighbor generally still gets to keep the barking dog. So I'm not gonna keep everyone happy. Someone that moves in beside us, we have a rental property beside us. They might hate chickens. They might hate the sound. They might just not like the idea of it. They might think it's unsanitary because they're not educated. So if we can provide education, then I think that's helpful. I, we're more than open to talk to anyone who w is interested in doing it, so we're, happy to communicate with our neighbors. We love our neighbors. We love Port Coburn. So we have no problem speaking to it. I think what happened when the complaint, or I don't even know if I want to call it a complaint, came in about us having chickens, was having this bylaw, it prevented us from speaking to our neighbors. It was really easy for someone to call and say these people have chickens and we don't even know who it is. I don't know who complained about an odor. I don't know when they complained about an order, or, odor. So I don't know how to fix these things when our neighbors don't even feel comfortable coming to us. So I do think that the bylaw needs to be in place with certain instructions on how to take care of the chickens properly so that everyone can do it perfectly. I know not everyone will. Everyone breaks rules and things happen. Maybe you need to add in a fenced in yard so the chickens aren't running free or maybe they have to be within cages. Ours were contained and they weren't running free. But I think if you have the rules in place, then we can abide by them. And hopefully everyone else would as well. And that would just be keeping the chickens safe as well. So we'd be advocates to that effect too, to keep the chickens safe and to keep our neighbors safe as well. Members of council, further questions or comments? Leslie, thank you. Thank you. And you did a great job, by the way. <laughs> I'm well sorry done. for interrupting. No, no problem. <laughs> hey, you're passionate about it. Thank I, you. I get that. Great job. Members of council, no further questions or comments? Members of staff, any questions or comments you may have? None? It's, all the, it's on the report, right? <laughs> Members to the report, uh, your pleasure to it. All those in favor? All those in favor, get your hands up. One, two, three, four, five. Opposed? One, two, three. So it's five against three. Okay? So the motion is carried, and the report is carried forward. I, you know what? I have, I have to speak on this. I know, I know it's, it's, it, has been, it has been voted on. The report is moved. But Leslie, don't give up. Okay? Don't give up. Come on back to the next meeting and ask for it again. Okay, and keep asking for it. Okay. okay. And what I would suggest is that the new council may in fact want to do exactly what you had actually suggested, is to come back with possible solutions versus just saying no. Okay. So I encourage you to do that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Members of council, we're going to move on to the next report. Item four, Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Worship. The Department of Planning and Development Report Number 2014-76, Subject Winter Control Operation Standards Update, that Council approved the proposed Winter Control Operation Standard as presented. Thank you, Councilor. Do have a seconder to that, please? Councilor Elliott, questions or comments? Councilor Kenny. Thank you. Um, there was just a couple of questions uh, through you to um, Mr. Hansen. Mr. Hansen, uh, uh, in regards to the, uh, the winter works, it was more uh, for me about the sidewalks. There's a couple areas, um, a couple areas in Port Coburn, as we well know that, um, there is no boulevard. So there's a road and then right away the sidewalk. And the, uh, on page, 67 of that report, um, it says, uh, 
the bodily department is responsible for monitoring the condition of sidewalks during the winter. But there are times when really, I believe, and I, and, and I know it's been followed up by um, staff, where because they have placed this big pile of snow from the road onto the person's sidewalk, that they've gone and removed that after 48 hours. Uh, sorry, yeah, I think it's a removal of snow is 24. I think they do it in 48 hours because they do all the roads first. I just want to make sure that, that that's not forgotten because every year I get the same call from the same people asking the same thing. And I just, I just want to make sure that they're on the radar. We know where they are. We know where that happened. And, and that was my only concern about the report. And, um, and so I just wanted to comment, I guess, on that. Thank you. Mr. Hanson? Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Kenny. We actually have over two kilometers of curb face sidewalk in the city in the urban area that we plow because there's actually no place to store uh, snow during the winter months. And, and as far as uh, the property one is concerned, there's no place for them to put the snow. So as I said, there's over two kilometers of sidewalk. We actually drop the wing on the sidewalk while we're plowing and actually take that snow away. So we are aware of those areas and hopefully we can stay on top of those uh, uh, during the regular winter months, regular storm. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Mr. Hansen. Uh, Ron, as part of the snow removal program, do we have um, scheduled gravel replacement for the spring? Because we take away a lot of the gravel with the snow removal all the time. And I, you know, you know from the number of calls that I've given you that we get people continually calling with the, the ponding and the loss of gravel and they have to come in and fix everything all up. I just thought if we had an automatic uh, program that kicked in in the spring and took care of all the damage that we've done through the winter, it would make life much simpler. Thank you. Mr. Hanson? Mr. Mayor, Councillor Demery. Yes, uh, in the spring we, we always have a, a large number of work orders. There, there's obviously there's sod damage uh, as the plows go through in some areas where there isn't curbs. Uh, other streets where there isn't curbs and there's uh, uh, stone shoulders, uh, it does do some damage to them. So. There's a regular grading program in the spring and also uh, quite a number of work orders, as I said, uh, for sod repairs and various things that occur during the winter months. So there's a cleanup program that occurs in the spring once the snow is gone. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. While we're on sidewalks, and while it doesn't bother me in Ward 4 necessarily, um, we get the same complaints year after year, and I think uh, DeWitt Carter School is one good example, right? The, the same complaints every time, every time it snows, they don't clear the sidewalk, we wait for a council meeting, we come, then you guys send them notice. Is there any way to have a sit down with these, I don't know, I think there's at least three areas that are constant complaints. Can we be proactive? Can the city talk to the school board, say, look, this is a problem, and we don't want to have it. You know you got to clean it. How about we get on this early? And um, when there might, there was a couple of businesses that were for sale and had the same complaint last year, but can we anticipate that and not just let it go until the first snowstorm and we got to react then? So I just wonder whether staff can just be proactive on that. Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Bodner, similar to what we do with long grass complaints, we know there's habitual offenders. We can send out a letter advising them of that. We place in the paper every year the fact that you need to remove snow from the sidewalk, but we will send out the letters to those repeat offenders that we know who they are to let them know that the bylaw says what it says and to hopefully get compliance without us having to chase them down. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. Councillor? Further questions or comments? Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to, to uh, address the DeWitt Carter School situation, the, the caretaker there now is, is very good about getting out and getting it done. Um, he has reacted very well to us having to call a few times. So that, that one has been taken care of, but there are still, C Councillor Bodner, you're right, there's still several other ones that should be addressed. Thank you. Further questions or comments? With none, I got one question, Ron. Now that I'm no longer the mayor, mm -hmm. can my can my road get done like like not last? 
<laughs> and maybe maybe like the 50th or something with that. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, that's a very secondary road, almost a laneway. <laughs> so read the report. Uh, that's a nope. That's a nope. Yeah, it's almost rural. <laughs> I noticed you said almost secondary. Almost secondary. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> With no further questions or comments, members, all those in favor? All those in favor, guys? Opposed? That'd be carried. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Kenny, item five. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Department of Planning and Development Report number 2014 77, subject recommendation report for a zoning bylaw amendment. File number D1410-14, 650 Barrick Road. One, that the Council of the City of Port Coburn approve the zoning bylaw amendment attached hereto as Appendix A, rezoning the land from residential development to R1 first density residential holding. Two, that the City Clerk is hereby authorized and directed to proceed with the giving of notice of passing of the bylaw in accordance with the Planning Act. And three, pursuant to the provisions of section 3417 of the Planning Act, no further notice of public meeting be required. Thank you, Councillor. Do have a second to that, please? Councillor Danch, questions or comments? Councillor Kenny. Just one second, Your Worship. I pulled the report um, actually to have um, um, our planner, um, actually is the acting deputy CAO to uh, to speak to this because we have some residents who were on Barrick who were concerned at the planning meeting in regards to um, the fact that a committee of adjustment approved the building lots on the condition that the owner enter into a development uh, agreement with the city to address the sanitary servicing of the lots which will require approval by city council prior to its execution. I just want to assure the residents that are here this evening that it is the developer's sole responsibility for that. And if Mr. Aquilina could address that, because that was a provision council uh, committee of adjustment made. And I just want to assure the people that are here that that's what's going to happen. Mr. Thanks. Aquilina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Kenny, that's absolutely the case in this recommendation report. The developer has to pay 100% of the costs. They need to execute a development agreement with the City of Port Colborne. Once that is done in consultation with engineering and planning staff, a report would then come back to council to lift the holding provision. These are required to create the two lots that are fronting on the south side of Barrick Road. And again, at of no cost to the homeowners in the area. It's strictly the cost to the developer of the properties. Thank you, Mr. Eklund. For the questions or comments? Now, I know you folks have been waiting here very patiently, and I appreciate that. Any comments or questions you may have? You're good? Okay. Members of Council, no further questions or comments? And none from staff? Your pleasure to the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Thank you. I'm going to move up to, uh, to item eight, members because uh, Mr. Lambie's been waiting here as well, very patiently. So I'm going to bump uh, his up, and I'll ask Councillor Steele to put that on the table. I could use my own computer tonight. They don't want to work. Uh, item number eight, Department of Planning and Development Report number 2014-82, subject request to reduce application fees for land severances at 727 Pleasant Beach Road, Michael and Jennifer Eberly. One, that council respectfully decline the request to reimburse all or a portion of the fees for the three consent applications at 727 Pleasant Beach Road, and two, that Brian Lambie be so notified. And I note that uh, Mr. Lambie is in attendance. Thank you. Members of council, do you have a second to that, please? Councillor Danch, questions or comments? Councillor Steele. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, myself, Councillor Kenny, and Councillor Elliott sit on Committee of Adjustment, so we're well aware of this, uh, that, that, that it, uh, what's gone on here. Um, with respect to that, I do have a few questions to Mr. Aquilina, since it was his department that put the applications, uh, or took the new application and put together the reports. Uh, so through you, Your Worship, to Mr. Aquilina. 
how much more work was there to take the old uh, info or the information that was already done that we granted at Committee of Adjustment to bring it back to Committee of Adjustment? Can you give us an outline of what's gone on? Mr. Aquino. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Steele. Once we receive the application, we need to confirm that the application is complete, whether it has to be notarized or not as part of the complete application process. Once we've received that, we need to then do the notice of public meeting. We need to assign a new file number. We need to assign a new meeting date. We need to then circulate the applications. We need to create the poster notices. We need to confirm that the property owners are the same and we need to check that the addresses are current. There's work involved with that. The only time savings that I see in this case is the actual assigning of the new file number and the hearing date. But again, we have to confirm that the information remains the same. In this particular case, the applications still need to be circulated to all the agencies. That doesn't save any time. In fact, this application has taken more time because now we have agency comments to take into consideration that is really the only savings that I see is that the application, the notice, if the same, it's the renumbering of the notice and it's the date of the hearing. Pretty much everything else still is required to be done. Council. Thank you, Your Worship. But in essence, the meat and potatoes of the report had been done, so most of that would have been drawn forward. Is that correct? Mr. Aquino. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Steele. The meat and potatoes, yes, when it comes to policies and zoning information. This particular case, we now have new sets of agency comments that we didn't have to address the last go around. So staff spent more time reviewing this application based on those new comments that weren't on the last application. Councilor. Thank you. I forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> um, 17 years, long time. Uh, yeah. um, oh, with regards to when the, the time period is up, so in this case they had one year, do we send out a notice prior to the end coming up that, hey, you only have a month left or two months or two weeks, whatever? Do we send a notice to, the, to these uh, applicants once it's gone through the Committee of Adjustment whatever they're asking for is granted and there is a time period that they have to do something uh, depending on the conditions that are on the, uh, that come out of Committee of Adjustment. Do we send out a reminder just to state that your cutoff date is here, you better act quickly? Mr. Aquino. Through Mr. Mayor, once we get the notice of decision, we inform the applicant that they have the one year time frame. The city has never actually followed up with any particular applicant notifying that there is a time crunch. Same with any draft plan of subdivision. We don't notify that the applications are going to be lapsing or the approval will lapse. We leave that up to the applicant, the developer, to keep on top of that. I would not suggest that we do that because then the onus is going to be on the municipality to be sure that every application, we're up to speed on where it sits. So no, we, we, we don't do that. Councilor? I knew the answer. <laughs> I knew you didn't do that. But I think some people around this table that don't sit on the Committee of Adjustment, obviously, may, may or may not know that. So that's why I was asking that question. So, um, you know, I mean, we do see these, you know, these aren't, some of these applications come through. Uh, they're obviously not uh, inexpensive. They're not going to make or break somebody, I don't think. But, you know, in this case, I think it's $3,200 was the number. Uh, through this, which they've paid once, so they got to pay it again. Um, uh, I am willing to defeat this motion and put a motion for a, a reduction in rate uh, forward, uh, but I'll let other, others speak at this time. Thank you, Councillor. For the comments or questions, Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you, um, again, I guess I would put this uh, over to uh, Mr. Lamby. Mr. Lamby, since you represent these people, these are your clients. I do not feel, and this is my own opinion, I do not feel that there should be an exemption on the first thing here. They came, they made this application, now they're coming back to Committee of Adjustment tomorrow night. But, Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday, that's right, Wednesday. So on that application is the one that I feel 
should be reduced, not this one. Not this one. This one, he, he's paid his fees. He's the one that um, never came back. And uh, you know what? I agree with, uh, with our planner that that's the developer's, the developer's role. He had this property. He made three separate severances. And um, if through you, your worship to Mr. Lambie, is he, there are three separate lots there? <coughs> so now you. he's going to, is that correct? Well, if, if I can, I'm I not sure. Mr. Lambie, do you want to speak? Okay, so yeah. if, if I can have a motion for leave to allow Mr. Lambie to speak, and Correct. that way members of council can, in fact, correct. ask him questions, that would be great. Was it listed delegation? I don't think you need to. Yeah, yeah. No, we no did. it's not. Yeah, yeah. No. it says on here. Uh, yeah, 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 but it's not, he's not listed as a delegation, no, <laughs> so he, he does need leave. So if I can ask for leave, Councillor Kenny, yeah. Councillor Butters, questions, yeah. comments? Well, All in yeah. favor? Yeah. Opposed? <laughs> carried? <laughs> to the motion to allow Mr. Lambie to speak? Kenny? Yeah. Demaray? All in favor? <laughs> Opposed? <laughs> Carried, thank you. <laughs> Councilor Kenny, go ahead. And Mr. Lambie, if you want to come to the podium. Councilor Kenny, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, again, I get, you probably heard my question, Brian, like I, uh, so he's hey, he has going to have three separate lots there. Correct. Which he obviously intends to sell. Correct. And will make money off of each of those lots. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> And probably good money since it's the, of, of the location where it is. Um, I certainly, um, you know, un, you know, sympathize with the fact that your client did not file um, in time. However, um, as far as your original um, application, I think that's what you're coming for, right? For, you want us to make this a one, this one application, this one eleven hundred instead of the. Um, 3,300, is that correct? Correct, yes. I don't agree with that on this first application. However, however, on the, the one coming on Wednesday night, Committee of Adjustment, as Council is aware, cannot make that decision about reducing fees. That decision has to come here in this chamber. And that's what I would ask for consideration to be given on the repeat, that that not be that 3,300, it would be this 1,100. Thank you, Councilor. Thanks. And I'm going to allow Mr. Lambie to speak on that. Mr. Lambie. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my clients were granted these severances a year ago. Uh, at those hearings, they represented themselves. Um, they did receive the notices. However, they're not familiar with the process because they had not done severances before and they did not appreciate the significance of the one-year limitation period. Uh, so consequently, the severances lapsed in July of this summer. As soon as they found out about that, they reapplied, and the hearing is scheduled for later this week. Uh, we're asking Council to reduce the fees from 3300 to 1100 uh, or In the original applications, they paid 3300 and they've also paid 3300 again. So they paid $6,600 for these severances. And uh, we're just asking that the council give some consideration to uh, reducing the second and third application. Um, they fully understand that they have the responsibility for the time limitations, but these things do happen. Uh, the hearing is basically a rehearing of severances that were already previously granted. So I do not expect or hope it's not that complicated. Thank you, Mr. Lambie. Councilor Kenny? Okay, further questions or comments, members? Both. I'll allow Mr. Lambie to answer any questions that you may have, but at the same time, general comments are accepted. Councilor <coughs> Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, Mr. Aquilina. Uh, have we had anybody, uh, this happen to anybody else, and they've come before council and asked for basically the same thing that uh, Mr. Lambie's asking? Mr. Aquilina. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner, yes. Two years ago, Brian Sove created a lot on Brookfield Road. The year lapsed. He came to this council requesting the monies to be waived. Council turned down his request. He was required to pay the full fee. Thank you. Councillor Bodner. Okay, that's kind of what I wanted out there. Thanks. Any further questions or comments, members? Councillor Butters. Yes, through you to Mr. Aquilina. Um, you talked about that there was additional work because 
now other agencies. Could you could you tell us tell me a little bit more about that process and how how that came about or how Mr. that adds to the work? Mr. Jacqueline. Through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Butters, when the application was circulated the last time, agencies are to send us their comments by a certain time so we can include those comments to when we write our final report to the Committee of Adjustments. The Conservation Authority never provided comments through us. They provided those at the last minute. The Committee of Adjustment received those. The Committee of Adjustment did not act on those comments. So now we have comments from the Conservation Authority that we need to address. We also have comments from our drainage superintendent con raising concerns with regards to stormwater and the fact of the poor drainage in the area. And there's a whole series of comments from the drainage superintendent that we had to address in our recommendation report to the Committee of Adjustment. Those weren't there at the last application. They never came in. So it's an opportunity now for staff, a requirement, to address the comments that came in from the agencies to then inform the Committee of Adjustment what those comments are and how to address those from a planning perspective. Just, you're welcome, Councillor Butters. But, but on that issue, that's inevitable anyways. At the end of the day, you would expect those comments to come back from those agencies through the application process. So I don't understand why it becomes an anomaly when the second application is made and why the cost has to be recovered from a second application when, quite frankly, the first application cost should address that process of accepting and then therefore reacting to agency comments. That's, that's the whole reason why you go through the process. Mr. Mayor, unfortunately, the Conservation Authority did not give us those comments in time for staff to include those comments in our comments. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the drainage superintendent. Last time, never provided the comments. Now they have. So we are addressing our final comments to react to the comments we received. Those okay. comments for us are new. But why, why my, my question, and therefore, I guess somewhat of a comment would be, why is that the problem of the applicant? When the applicant makes a submission, makes an application through the Committee of Adjustment and or a city, the expectation of the value they got out of that process is that they would be receiving, you would be receiving comments from other agencies. It's not up to them to go chasing those agencies for those comments. It's, it's, it's up to those agencies to be responsible enough to actually make the comments and then therefore have those comments be reacted to within the process. So to, to, to make the statement that we're recouping money or dollars or costs because an agency happened not to get their comments in on time shouldn't be borne by the applicant. As a matter of fact, it may want to be borne by those that, are, that were not diligent in getting those comments forward. So quite frankly, I don't, I don't buy the fact that we have to recoup dollars from an applicant that would otherwise expect that value in their initial application. I don't see where it's their fault that the comments didn't come in in time, and then therefore we have to recoup costs because those comments didn't come in in time. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, excuse me, with any application we circulate and comments are expected. Sometimes they don't come, sometimes they do. When they do come in, we need to address those as part of the application process. We provide the comments to the Committee of Adjustment. The recouping of the money has nothing to do with the fact that the applications now have comments from those agencies. The comment was from Councillor Steele. What staff time is now responsible. I, I respond to that because of the comments that have came from the application agencies, it's now requiring us to address those. And in fact, we didn't have to address those before. I'll, I'll ask it in an easier way. If in fact the process started, the application was made, the money was paid, the costs were established, and the comments then came in as you're receiving now in the second application process, they came in in the first application process. Is that an extra cost to the applicant? Or is that or is that value that that applicant receives within that process that they've already paid for? Mr. Mayor, if they if they apply for the application fee, that cost is covered through that application fee. Which is my point. Which is my point. So so to make the comment that because these comments are now received and then therefore this money is justified, well they've already paid the original amount of dollars. And those comments should have came in when they made those initial investments to the application process. They're now just paying for it a second time. And it just so happened when they are paying for it a second time that those agencies have now come with comment. So 
my point is, is that they already paid once for those comments to be received. Whether they were or not isn't their problem. They just happen to be paying for it a second time now, and those comments are now being received. Yeah. So Mayor, that's, that's my point. Yeah, and maybe I uh, misspoke or maybe a lack of understanding. Any application, it requires a processing to be done. Whether or not an agency made comments before or whether an agency makes comments now, the fact of the processing remains the same regardless of those comments received. The staff time involved is still going to be the same. Mm -hmm. The comments though we've received now is just going to require that staff prepare a response to those comments. But the staff application fee, or the application fee is to cover all those costs, whether they came in before or whether they came in now. We still need to process and circulate the application. So, the so basically, they should have a refund the first time around because you didn't have to comment on those. <laughs> no, Mr. Mayor, those comments, the one set of comments came in through the, through the Committee of Adjustment elected not to abide or, or take them into consideration. So. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. So that's put on some questions. That's good. <laughs> and the Council of and back the Council of just kind of clearing it up. We've passed a bylaw that sets a fee a schedule for applications. Regardless of what happens on agency comments, to come for severance and consent costs you a thousand bucks. Doesn't matter if ten comment or nobody comments, it's a thousand dollars, which they paid, they got their paper, they came to the committee of adjustment and they let it lapse. You paid your money, you got your approval. You let it lapse. Now they're reapplying, and the same course holds true. Here's our fee. It's $1,000 to reapply for each individual lot. you got to pay your $1,000. Whether one agency comments or 100 comment, you still have to pay your $1,000. Because staff time was used in the first go-round. Staff time was used in the second go-round. Regardless of comments from agencies, our staff time was used. This time they actually use more time because of the comments that were made by the MPCA. And so it, it's, it's when, you, when you set a fee schedule that we've already set, if your time has elapsed, well, you spent that money and it's gone, now you have to reapply. So it's like you're starting from scratch again. Now staff time starts all over again for the second application. They're still gonna go through their, all their works MPCA made comment, region makes comment, drain, drain the superintendent makes comments. Now they've got to put that in. So there's actually more time in the second one, but there's no extra charge for that. <laughs> a, a debatable, yeah, debatable. So to say that it should have been less the first time and more the second time, it probably comes out in the wash. Um, you know, we haven't waived that before um, for people that, that have reapplied. And, and the Solvay property is, is the good instance. Um, I feel bad for, for people that have it elapsed, but as Mr. Lambie said, they were ignorant of the, the, tw the, the one year time frame, and I believe in a court of law, ignorance is not an excuse for not knowing the law. Um, they should have known. It's unfortunate that it happened, but it's happened in the past and it will probably happen in the future. Maybe that's what we have to guard against. In retrospect, to, to forgive an application that's already elapsed, to forgive that money, I can't, I can't do that. But going forward for what they're bringing in later this week, if that wants to come back to council because they came back a second time, we may revisit that. But for the first application, which this is in respect of, you've already spent the money and you should have acted within the year yeah I can't I can't give them <coughs> grace on on that but going forward that would be a, a, a different discussion thank you Councillor Elliott Councillor Bodner I'm not sure there's anything left to say Councillor Elliott pretty much covered everything there that I was going to say but you know it's unfortunate uh, and it's probably going to cost them um, some more time too if the drainage superintendent is now involved and the conservation authority is now involved I, I would suspect i don't know that for sure but you know the clear fact is that it isn't our fault that they let it lapse 
they came back to us, staff had to do the work. We've always said that we should get paid for staff's time. Um, and like Councillor Elliott said, we ha this has come up before and we haven't, uh, you know, we haven't said that people don't have to pay it again. Um, I think um, I would have to go with the recommendation that's on the table. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Steele. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Just uh, through you to, to Mr. Aquilina and, and also to the clerk, just to clarify, so if we, if we accept this motion because it speaks to the former application, no, it's speaking to the new application, that's correct? Right. Okay, because that's where if I... If I can have Mr. Eckman speak on just, that, because I think he's chopped yeah. up a bit on this one. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Steele. The report speaks to the new applications that have been filed that the Committee of Adjustment will hear on Wednesday night. That's right. Mr. Lambie has confirmed that the applications were paid previously, and that, that has been settled. That, that's long gone. Hey. The request is for the three applications that are before the Committee of Adjustment Wednesday and Mr. Lambie is requesting instead of paying the three application fees that only one application fee be paid for all three applications. Thank you because I just wanted that to be clarified because there was some okay. confusion and some comments around the table because we're not whatever's done has been done it's been done paid there's no argument about that it's it's what's coming up which I do agree with my fellow counselors here that I have no problem on, on doing that. So I, again, I would support um, defeating this motion and I can bring another motion forward. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Lambie. Mr. Lambie, in uh, this report, it says that uh, you're asking council to grant concession to your client and that you were gonna make the same request of the region and the NPCA. How did you make out there? Mr. Lambie? Any concessions from those fellows? The uh, Conservation Authority did grant some concessions. The uh, Instead of considering them as three minor applications, they considered it as one major application. That was a lower fee. The region have not been able to approach yet because of the election. There's no committee meetings until December. Okay. But we will be approaching, yes. Okay. Thank you. Members of Council, further questions or comments? Councilor Bodner. Just for clarity, Councillor Steele, can you tell us what you're thinking as far as what the other motion might be? Councillor Steele. Once you defeat this, I'll be glad to bring that forward. <laughs> oh, I, I think, I, Councillor, Councillor with, with all due courtesy, I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I, think I will bring forward. I will bring an olive branch. Yeah, I know, I know. I will bring, I'm just, okay. Uh, I will be bringing forward a reduction in the fees for the new application. So you're, you're, what you're saying is, is that what Mr. Lambie is asking for with the one fee versus the three? You're the one fee, for? whether it's exactly what Mr. Lambie asked for, I'm not 100% sure, but Council it will be a lower fee. Councilor Barton. Okay, so then can I get clarification from Councilor Kenny when she says she would be willing to waive the fee that the Committee of Adjustment imposes? Um, and how much is that? Is that That's this fee? Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Your Worship, through you to uh, Councillor Bodner. Now I've thought about it a lot, see? Um, and I know this is for the new application. And at first, honestly, I thought there should be a reduction. I, I, I really, in my heart, thought there should be a reduction until I heard our planner speak and our acting CAO and tell me that there was more work involved the second time round than the first time around. So as much as I sympathize with the individuals, I also know they have three brand new lots and they're gonna make money on those lots and that money will pay for the fees that are gonna be charged. These are fees. We, um, Mr. Aquilina told us of another time when another taxpayer came forward and asked for waiving of the fee and we turned them down. And I think we have to be consistent here, and consistency is the best policy. And uh, even though, in my head, I can't see how it could be more work when the work's already done. That's what I can't get my head around, but um, I will support uh, uh, the report that no reduction, no reduction. I think I, I think I answered your question, 
Councillor Dessette. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. <laughs> Councillor Dessette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Maybe I can add this too. Why are we saying there is a year if we're going to now reduce it after a year because they forgot to come back? So we're giving them a year to do, the, do everything they have to do and they, they, they miss it. And as Councillor Elliott said, ignorance of the bylaw is not an excuse, bottom line. Every time an application comes into staff, staff have to review everything to make sure it's the same and consistent. They still have to review it. They're still doing the work every time. So after all I'm concerned, I believe that this individual, because he missed a timeline, has to pay like everyone else. Because now it's a brand new application. Even if it's exactly the same, it's still a brand new application. Staff still have to go through it. Still, staff still has to go do what they have to do. So, after all, I'm concerned he should be paying it. Members of Council, for the questions or comments, Council voters. Well, I've listened to everybody really closely, and I have to think back to a time when there was a developer that came forward that that wanted some relief, and and he'd ran into problems in developing a property and. And um, we did, we did give him that relief, and I didn't vote for that then. And um, within a very, very short period of time, a very well-known developer came here, crying the blues, and he too needed relief. And of course, because we'd done it for the one fella, he very much expected that there must have been some grand mistake in the world, and and he must have that relief as well. So in the, um, I'll be supporting this uh, recommendation. Thank you. Members of Council, further questions or comments? To the motion, all those in favor? Opposed? It'll be carried. Thank you. We'll now move on to item seven, Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The description of this Department of Planning and Development report number 2014-80 information report, waiving of industrial and commercial development charges, and the recommendation is that the council receive this report for information purposes. Thank you, Councillor. Have a second to that, please. Councillor Steele, questions or comments? Councillor Butters. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I did lift this one. Um, Mainly, I'm happy that it's come forward, and and that's uh, that's wonderful. But I would, what I would like to know is, for the one commercial um, development that did uh, predate this report, and that individual came in and asked for, um, you know, being exempt from those development charges. Now we're going to, hopefully, I'm assuming, pass this um, tonight. Um, is there a, a thought process around this table that would say? that that developer um, who's developing a property on Steele and Colley Street, I believe, um, would he be able to qualify for this exemption? Mr. Aquilina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Butters. Butters. First of all, this report is for information purposes, so Council will have to defeat the recommendation and put forward a motion. I'll, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor. Um, is there any way to amend it to make it kind of a retroactive or is that is that possible to do that or not? Mr. Aquilina. Through Mr. Mayor, firstly council would have to defeat the report and then bring a motion forward with what council uh, directs to do. Are they going to exempt all industrial, all of commercial? Once that is done, then I think the conversation can be had about possibly retroactively giving back relief. Councillor? Well, I think that in, in, in terms of being fairness and consistent to, to that individual, it would be, um, I'd be prepared to do that. Thank you. Further questions or comments, members? Councillor Bod Bodner. Through you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Aquilina, can you just be a little clearer on that? Um, so, what's this? If we defeat this, what changes? Because um, we don't have to have more public meetings or anything like that, or do we? Or 
Mr. How does that all work? Mr. Aquilino? Through Ms. Mayor, if council defeats this and wants to move forward with exempting industrial and commercial from the development charges, we need to have a public meeting under the Development Charges Act, notify all the public, we hold a public meeting, and then council would have to then uh, follow up report, move forward with a change to the development charges bylaw, which we then would have to notify again, and there's an appeal period under the Development Charges Act. At that time, when the, when the public meeting is held, we can inform of what council's direction is to be with regards to the development charges reductions. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Mayor, through you to Mr. Aguilina. Is there, is there a way to approach what Councillor Butters is asking for um, if we were to pass this, because it's for information, right? Yeah. Um, then at the next council meeting, bring something forward. Uh, would that inhibit council butters from doing that? Or is it easier to, I just don't wanna, I mean, I'm intrigued by maybe following what she's thinking, but I'm not quite sure yet. And uh, how can we, well, will passing this stop uh, allowing this developer to apply for a reduction in those development charges. Mr. Aquilino. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner. I think it would be prudent if Council has an appetite for this, make a direction tonight to move forward with amending the development charges bylaw, and then at the next, what staff will then do is hold a public meeting under the Development Charges Act to inform the public as what the bylaw should be. Once Council then has a public meeting and passes the bylaw, then there can be some consideration for the, ch for the uh, reduction or reimbursement to the property on the corner of Steel and Kalali. That's uh, the only commercial property that has been developed, and I think that's what Councilor yes. Butner is, is referring to. So that would be my recommended course of action if Council wants to move forward with amending the development charges bylaw to waive all industrial and commercial for a period of two years. The report provides council with information if that is to be done, what the implications are from a tax perspective on the levy next year. I just, just, just so we stop sort of going in circles here, because we had the same, the same discussion for the last two meetings at council. And, and for the most part, that was the direction some of the councillors, including myself, were trying to embark upon, was, was what Councillor Butters is, is stating here, or the direction that you're taking here. In defense of, of a lot of the other comments, was the fact of wanting more information with respect to the impacts that that direction would take. And what Mr. Aquilina is stating here, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, is you have that information now. So, and hence the reason why this report is actually for information. Now, once digesting this information, what direction do you want to take? And what Dan's asking is, is that once you establish that direction, give it to staff, let them come back with a report that actually outlines the direction that you're giving them. To wrap it up pretty good. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. So I got Councillor Bonner, you still got the floor. You're good? Okay, so I have Butters and Elliot. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So passing this to tonight doesn't prevent um, any kind of amending to, to retroactively include um, the Clowley Street, Still Street development property then. Okay, because that was my thought process is just to make kind of like if we're gonna go forward with this, you know, to be able to give that opportunity to, to this, this report, Councilor Butters, yeah. is an information report? Yes. Okay, and that's what it was asked to be uh, okay. by Council. My suggestion to Council now is that now that you've digested this report, mm -hmm. give staff direction to go back. Uh, if it is with the exemption, then so be it. And then Dan will come back with the proper protocol process and report from members of Council okay. to then entertain. So would he, he, he would you have that uh, direction tonight then? And if that being the case, then I would put that direction forward tonight for the next report okay, Mr. to Aquilina. include that um, property. Mr. Mayor, I could do one better. If the direction tonight is to proceed, there won't be a report coming back to council. The information is contained in this report. It would be a public meeting report mm -hmm. talking about the development charges bylaw amendment. Great, thank you. Okay. Councilor Elliott. Awesome, Dan, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
And on another part of the, uh, <laughs> the report, just where it says that we've had approximately uh, five new or expanding industrial developments over 5,000 square feet per year, multiply that by the current development charge, 5,000 times buck 20 times five, collect $30,000 in development charges or 0.24% of the tax levy. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Peter, the development charges go to supply funding for what elements in the city? Mr. Sanez. Through you, Mr. Mayor, the development charges go to specific um, infrastructure. Um, goes, it's, it's split in the development charge bylaw to areas of public works, parks, um, fire, library, um, corporate services. Water and sanitary sewer. Growth, re growth related. Growth related. Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you, Peter. And did we use any of the thirty thousand dollars that we collected, or any of the reserve funds that were impacted by those five developments? Mr. Sinez. The development charges that were used just last year was for the. Water for Valley Health and Wellness Center, and uh, I believe some road work. Okay. And I, and I just asked that because down in the conclusions where it says if we waive them for the two years, we will have to raise taxes by approximately 0.24% in order to make up the potential loss in development charges collected. And that's only if any developments that are built, and we hope that there is some, will negatively impact the elements that you stated that development charges go to. And as I stated before, when we waive the residential ones, um, basically we're infilling. So wherever people are building, it's really not impacting growth related charges because there is no growth because everybody's building in the built up area. We're not expanding the services that we require. So I'm just, I, I just don't want to get ahead of ourselves and say, Hey, when budget comes, Here's that 2.24% in here for the $30,000 that we're going to lose because that would be putting the cart before the horse because you're not exactly sure if and when, if anything, is going to be developed next year. So to budget for it without even saying that it's there, I mean, if you want to do it retroactively and things were built out next year and cost money and impacted us as, as an expansion charge, you could always recoup it and tax it out in in. 16, but to put it on 15's budget and put it in the levy when you're not sure if anything's going to get built, I think is, is getting ahead of yourself. So I, you'd have to wait and see what happens next year before you can actually say that that money is missing from the budget, if that makes sense. And if you want to correct me if I'm wrong, be my guest. <laughs> Don't talk region, only city. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Through, through Mayor. It's true, we don't collect a lot of development charges, but what we do collect, and, and the idea of the, of the percentage of what we would typically lose in a, in a normal year uh, based on past history would be that those development charges would be collected and be put into the reserve or deferred revenue accounts, whatever you want to call them, for future growth, whether that, that could be used next year, could be used 10 years from now. But the, the whole idea of the development charges is to collect them over time so that when you do need them, you have the funds in order to, um, to move forward on some development charge, on some developments and reduce the cost of those, of those uh, developments. So it, it, it's a go forward. So the fact is, is if you put it on the budget, because we are technically losing those dollars and you're putting on those budgets, then we would put those dollars into the, um, the uh, reserve for the future because we are losing them from specifically from developers but it will be collected throughout the from the uh, the whole rate base and I totally agree with you except for one flaw in that is that you're collecting development charges on somebody that's building today that's had no impact on the services and putting it in the bank for tomorrow when somebody else is going to build and then you're going to have them pay for what the other guy's building which doesn't make sense because if you're building today and it's no impact on services, you're still paying development charges. But I didn't cost you anything, right? You're, you're, you're collecting them and you're gonna put them in the reserve account, right? So we haven't spent the development charge that we collected. 
because there's really been no expansion in the services on what the development charge is supposed to go to, right? The ambiguity of, the ambiguity of development charges. <laughs> it is. It is, and, and that's, that's my biggest problem with them, is you're not actually paying for what you use or didn't use. In a lot of cases, development charges are being paid for something that they didn't use. If I, if I can just jump in here for a second. And, and I was deliberate when I actually said to Peter, you know, regional versus municipal. And the reason why is because you're right to some extent, probably close to about 80% when it comes to municipal, because yeah, like roads, sidewalks, like parks, <laughs> water, sewer, things of that nature. However, we still, you still have some growth related charges when it comes to fire. You still have some growth related charges when it comes to the other that doesn't seem as, 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 as to be hard services. Yeah. They're, they're more yeah. ambiguous, but, but regional especially, when you have policing, when you have public health, you have community services, and things of that nature. So there are some growth related costs attached to those other services. But you are correct when it comes to the harder services like road, water, wastewater, yeah. sidewalks, and parks, and things of that nature. Yeah. So you're, you're collecting for, for down the road. So I just, all I wanted to speak to was just that and it says in the conclusion that, you know, in the budget, 2.4%, the $30,000 are going to have to levy it to get it back, which we could wait and see on that because I do believe we got some money in, in, uh, in the reserve fund. But I just want to echo what Dan says defeat this. Barbie even said it too. Let's let's defeat this and bring back direction to bring the report. Well, yeah, yeah. What I what I would suggest we do, guys, if if, if, if you're all and I'm, and I'm sensing some consensus here, yeah. is pass the report, give Dan some direction, uh, so that way he can pick out this okay. report and come back with a public meeting. Okay, under, under the act. That's the easiest way to do it. That's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Peter, I know you're chomping at the bit there. I, get it off your chest. Get it off your chest. Say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was just going to say that it, it is an opportunity cost that we're, that we would be losing. Um, and it, it, you know, although it is for growth, potential growth, it is for the infilling too, uh, to a certain degree. And when they do the report on the development charges, it's based on what projects, um, are, um, are on the books to, on a go forward basis. And, uh, so, and it affects a lot of the different, different areas. So. But it is an opportunity cost that, that's lost, basically. Thank you, Mr. Sinez. <laughs> Councillor Steele? You're, Dave, you're all right? You're right? Okay. Yeah. Councillor Steele? Thank you, Your Worship. And I think the reserve is somewhere around $632,000, if that comes back to my mind correctly, from the report we had. So I do agree with Councillor Elliott, although he, I thought he was going in the whole opposite direction about the 0.24%. We talked about this last time is that, look, Council's going to have to, and I think you guys all said, a lot of the same things a few meetings ago is that you know you're gonna have to wrap your head around this that look we're gonna try something here that you hope that the development spurs on more taxes that are gonna be far greater than the thirty thousand dollars you're you're, you're gonna lose not necessarily and I won't say lose it you're not gonna collect because you're not losing it you do have a reserve you use it prudently you 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 you, you set out your projects so that as time goes on and those development charges come back if that's the, the, what the council of the day wants to do is bring them back you're gonna collect it then because as Councillor Elliott says, you know, you're collecting today for tomorrow in a lot of cases. We all realize that some of that 30000 each year is used for a, a small amount of things that go on within City Hall and other things. But yes, but we do have a, a pretty healthy reserve for a city of our size that you can rely on to take you, bridge you through that gap, which really is only 2016. So, I, and I think council would be very prudent. At. But the only other comment I got to make is, <laughs> I've been sitting here chuckling to myself, is I just hope that by, by, by the time we pass this one, that Councillor Butter's shoes dry from changing horses in midstream, where she didn't support one developer, and now she wants to give money to another <laughs> developer. I had to say it, Barb. I'm sorry, but you know, I've only got one more meeting left, so I got to get them all in now. But. Uh, you know, I, I, I lend her my shoes, but I think mine are a little bit too big for her feet. So, I mean, they're, they're really dry, but I, I know your shoes would be, yeah, they're, they're black. Um, but, uh, yeah, her feet must be wet from changing horses Councilor. midstream. But, anyways, I do support what Councillor Butter says, by the way, with regards to this developer. You know, he's come forward. He's put a new building up where, where building existed before. So, uh, I have no problem with that because, quite frankly, that uh, he, uh, he he's put a development where there was something before where, I don't know what what is different there, but anyways, 
uh, but I will support it. And yes, let's give direction to Dan. Let's move forward with this. Let him bring back it for the, for the public meeting so that we can move these development charges so that we can spur on development. So it's all waived. Okay. Further questions or comments? Members? No. Councillor Bodner. Just one com comment, Councillor Steele. You're lucky you only got one meeting left. That's all I got to say. Uh, and you're on that side, man. <laughs> Councillor Steele and I have already made a, a pact. Yeah. We've, we've let Ashley know that we're going to be a delegation for every single council meeting for the next four years. So we're already on the list. Uh, <laughs> that's Remember, the already made plans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Members of council, any further questions or comments? All those in favor of the report? Opposed? That will be carried. Now, staff direction. Councillor Butters. The staff direction that um, they would um, include uh, um, the ability t for the development uh, on Killally and Still Street to um, be able to apply for the, um, the exempted from our development charges. Okay, if I can have you, please. Councillor Steele, Councillor Butters. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. The motion is on the floor. It's moved by Councillor Butters, seconded by Councillor Steele. Are there any questions or comments to that? Dan, you all right with that? You got her? Okay. Any, more, any further staff comments? Peter, you're good? You got that one? Okay. No further questions? Well, Councillor Steele, go ahead. Th thank you. Just quick clarification through you to, to, to Mr. Aquilina. Is there anything going on right now that falls under the Clally Street development that may not get in on time? Mr. Aquilina? Or are things kind of quiet right now that once this is passed and brought forward, they should fall under it? Through Mr. Mayor, the, the Kalali development has already re received a building permit. Site plan application has paid the development charges both yeah. from the city and the region. The city's charge on that application was 6800 The region's was close to 40000 right. just to give you some perspective. Okay. But there's nothing on the books. Okay. No further comments or questions? All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Thank you. Councillor Steele, item nine. Thank you, Worship. This is for Councillor Elliott's conflict. Department of Planning and Development Report Number 2014-83, subject sale of 80 Nickel Street and parcel at the northeast corner of Nickel and Mitchell Street. One that Council declares 80 Nickel Street in lots 20 to 23 and part lot 24 on plan 857 as surplus to the city's needs. Two that Council enters into agreement purchase and sale with Shivitra Bikram. Uh, for the sale of 80 Nickel Street for the purchase price of $45,000 plus HST. Three, that the council enters into agreement and purchase of sale with Shavitra Bikram uh, for the sale of lots 20 to 23 and part lot 24, plan 857 for purchase price of $5,000 plus HST. Four, that the city clerk prepares the necessary bylaw for council's approval. And five, that the mayor and clerk and city solicitor be authorized to sign and execute any and all documents respecting the sale of these lands. Thank you, Councilor Seconder. Councilor Demery, questions or comments to that? Noting the conflict, all those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Thank you. Move on to item 12. Item 12. <laughs> Councilor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, let me get to it. Uh, Department of Community and Corporate Services, Community Services Division Report Number 2014-28, Subject Canal Days Marine Heritage Festival 2014, Postmortem Report. A council received the 2014 Canal Days Marine Heritage Festival Report for information, and that staff devised a budget outline for 2015 budget deliberations. There was a second of that, please. Councillor Steele, Councillor Elliott, you're up. I am up, and I won't talk about anything in the report except get on page 154. Da, 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 da. First paragraph down at the bottom. Um, 
There's potential to incorporate additional vendors at this location south of the Clarence Street Bridge. However, festival infrastructure must include adequate access to hydro and water supply and include aesthetic improvement to the landscape. Any future plans to improve this area must include community services, event services staff in the design and planning process. And I have an issue with that because the CIP uh, drawings have already been drawn and the detailed design has already been done. And I just want to know what community service event staff would be looking to include in that and do we have to have any new drawings done to incorporate that? Mr. Hakeem. <clears throat> uh, through your worship to Councillor Elliott, it's mainly to address uh, hydro and water issues so that we have appropriate connections to those that require that service particularly for vendors, um, that would be the uh, most primary concern as far as any development in that area. Thank you. Okay, thank, yep. thank you, Harry. It just said, um, where it says that, you know, must include in the design and planning process, that's done. The design has already been done, and the planning process, well, we're just looking for money. There probably will be some tweaking of the, um, the design as we go forward if we get there hopefully we will um, but I'm just wondering if you could we could change that just to say that any concerns that community services may have can promote their concerns through uh, through engineering and engineering can bring it to uh, to the table should we uh, get to that point it just that when I saw that the design the, the detailed design has already been drawn we've got that sitting on the shelf right now so when I read that it's like well, that's already been done, so. Okay, thank you. For the, for the questions or comments, Mr. Hakim, do you want to comment? Uh, no, with all due respect to Councillor Elliott, Your Worship, um, that would be fine. I think it's just a matter of, of really considering the fact that if the festival area and the footprint is expanding, and in fact, I think just to perhaps correct something here, I, uh, we're also considering areas uh, north of the uh, Clarence Street Bridge because that area was expanded upon this year as well. So some consideration there, and I'm not sure if the CIP includes that aspect as well. But it would be prudent to have you know our staff involved in some aspect to understand that these, these things are considerations, particularly if you're gonna uh, involve festival uh, growth and development. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Councilor. Yeah, thanks, Harry. Uh, Ron, that would be no problem, should we? Well, let's put it this way. Should you be here? <laughs> or whoever is in engineering, because CIP might take a few years to get going, and um, who well, knows? Ron plans on putting another 10 years in. You gonna be, you gonna be here that long? <laughs> <laughs> if, if we, yeah, if we could, if there's, if there's issues that, uh, that uh, community services has with infrastructure that needs to take place and be put in place along West Street, I mean, we need to know that before we start doing anything. And like I say, basically we've got the drawings done for above ground, um, the underground stuff. I mean, you guys would have to take a look at that. But if there's gonna be any anything that you guys need in particular, there's gotta be a conversation between departments to let us know going forward. So if we can have that, that would be great. Thank you, Councillor. For the questions, comments, members of council? All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried, thank you. Councillor Elliott, you are up for okay. item 15. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, memorandum from Harry S. Akeem, Manager of Community Services, Reconal Days Marine Heritage Festival Service Providers. One, the Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Coburn approved the recommendation made by the Canal Days Committee to secure an additional three-year agreement with each Canal Days vendor that includes TNR Productions, Red Boss, Pyrotechnics, Star Security, Townsend Amusements, SG Electrical, St. Catharines Transit, OCI, Dash, Portable Washroom Services, two. That staff be directed to execute the appropriate agreements in line with the recommendation and secure an additional three-year service agreement with a 2.5 annual increase, 2.5% annual increase with each Canal Days vendor and three, the council direct the city clerk to execute the appropriate bylaws for each of the Canal Day service providers for the mayor and clerk to execute on behalf of the corporation. Seconder, please. Councillor Steele, questions or comments? Councillor Elliott. 
Uh, two questions. The 2.5% annual increase is a guaranteed increase for these people, and B, what does that translate into in additional costs for the three years? Uh, it, uh, to, uh, through your worship to Councillor Elliott, it's up to 2.5%. I think we'll qualify that statement. Um, as to what it translates, I, I think our costs right now have been held uh, to the budget that Canal Days has been able to uh, produce pretty much, and in some cases uh, really hold the line as far as cost savings. So it would be, a, let's say, a 2%, two, up to 2.5% increase on those budgeted figures, which I think we've reflected somewhat in, in the uh, up and coming budget, right now. up to, but it's, it's a variable. No. Okay, Councilor Elliott. Yeah, because when I read it, it says basically they get 2.5 percent each each person, which translates into 7.5 percent increase for each of the vendors, which is seven vendors. What's a seven and a half percent increase over three years for seven people? Is it twenty thousand, thirty thousand, forty thousand dollars that we're looking at? I mean, seven people per year at a two and a half percent increase. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what their cost is to us. Every year, Mayor Peter can give us a ballpark figure, but the way I read it, it was 2.5% guaranteed per vendor per year, which translates into some dollars in operating going forward. May I, may I suggest, and I'll accept a, a recommendation from the councillor to amend the recommendation to be up to 2.5%. That would be negotiable with staff and, and, and of course, the, uh, the vendor. If I can have a seconder to that, please, Councillor Steele. That's fine, Councillor Elliott. Absolutely. Questions or comments to that amendment? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Back to the motion as amended. Are there any further comments or questions? You're all good? Okay. All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Thank you. <clears throat> and I believe that's it. Great job, guys. Wonderful job. Yeah, you know I do that every meeting. I, I do it every meeting. I, I want to get right into the meat and potatoes of it, eh? <laughs> Members of Council, I'm going to move on to the adoption of the minutes. We do have the minutes of the 23rd meeting regular of the Committee of the Whole, dated October 14, 2014. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Bodner, Councillor Doucette. Are there any questions or comments? Recorded votes? Everybody's good? You guys, see, I cut you guys sleeping. I cut you guys sleeping. <laughs> All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Thank you. Notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion? Councilor Doucette. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. At the uh, next council meeting, I will be presenting a notice of motion for um, taxation of the seniors and, and adjustments of, if that's possible. Great. Thank you, Councilor. Are there any notices of motion further? Members of Council? With none, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Councilor Doucette, Councilor Elliott, questions or comments? All in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Thank you. Did you guys want a one minute or two minute little break here before we move on? Sure. Okay, so I'll just take a one minute break just so you can get up and stretch. <laughs> Members, if I can call this meeting, regular council meeting to order and ask the clerk if she can present any addendum items she may have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and on this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk, motion to confirm the agenda, please. Councillor Steele, Councillor Butters, questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Disclosures of interest. Are there any disclosures of interest? Councillor Elliott? Item 9, I have a pecuniary interest as I provided the uh, valuable opinion. Or opinion of value. Uh, <laughs> sit down sure while you're ahead. I'm not sure that was a valuable opinion, but we, <laughs> it sure it certainly that was a valuable opinion. <laughs> That's a matter of opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Members of Council, any further disclosures? With none, I do have two sets of minutes here I'm going to ask for your adoption on. Mover and seconder, I'm going to be looking for. Minutes of the 30th meeting special of Council, dated October 14, 2014. And the minutes of the 31st meeting regular of Council, of October 14, 2014. You know, I'm starting, to, I'm starting to really feel like the supply teacher right now. Okay, so. <laughs> so ease up, guys. <laughs> Okay, so both minutes, members, if I can have a mover and seconder, please. Okay. Councillor Steele, Councillor Doucette, questions or comments? 
All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Items requiring separate discussion? Councillor Steele? Item 9. Thank you. Any further items, members? With none, I'll accept the motion to accept the remainder of the items, please. Councillor uh, Demaray, Councillor Danch, questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. To item 9, Councillor Steele. Seconder, please. Councillor Danch, questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Members, I do have three proclamations here, and I will be looking for a mover and seconder. The first proclamation is Pulmonary Hypertension Month, November 2014. Whereas pulmonary hypertension, PH, is a disease affecting the arteries of the lungs, it can strike anyone regardless of age, sex, social, or ethnic background. And whereas in pulmonary hypertension, which means high blood pressure in the lungs, the arteries of the lungs become narrowed and scarred, which can result in almost complete closing of the arteries. And whereas people affected with this disease suffer from continuous high blood pressure in the lungs, which results in an enlargement of the heart and can lead to heart failure and death. And whereas some symptoms of pulmonary hypertension are shortness of breath, especially with activity, bluish or purplish hands, Feet, feet and lips, swelling of hands and feet, lightheadedness, dizziness, especially when climbing stairs or standing up, chest pain, especially with physical activity, feeling tired all the time, and sometimes even fainting. And whereas the somewhat generic symptoms as seen above, and as mentioned above, often get mistaken for other less serious illnesses and conditions such as asthma, patients therefore experience significant delays in receiving life-saving treatments that can slow the progress of this disease. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Vance M. Badaway, proclaim the month of November 2014 to be Pulmonary Hypertension Month here in the city of Port Coburn and encourage all citizens of Port Coburn to visit www.phacanada.ca for more information. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Steele, Councillor Kenny, questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. <coughs> That was a long one. <laughs> the second proclamation members I'll be looking for a mover and seconder on. That whereas philanthropy involves a generosity of spirit, a desire to help, a firm belief that you can make a difference in your community regardless of how much or how little you have to give. Whereas Nas National <laughs> Philanthropy Day on November 15th recognizes and celebrates the profound impact that philanthropy and those people active in the philanthropic community have made to our lives, our communities, and our world. And whereas the Niagara Community Foundation has taken this one day celebration and extended it to a month of activities and events connected to philanthropic initiatives throughout November, starting November 7th, with Random Act of Kindness Day, which has just passed. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Vance M. Badaway, proclaim November 2014 as Philanthropy Month here in the city of Port Coburn, and I encourage citizens to participate, participate in the various events throughout the community and to help all achieve their philanthropic dreams, big and small, that celebrate the spirit of philanthropy. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Doucette, Councillor Elliott, questions or comments? <coughs> All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. <clears throat> and the final proclamation, members, with respect to World's AIDS Day, December 1, 2014, that whereas HIV AIDS remains an urgent public concern worldwide, in Niagara, it is estimated that more than 550 people are living with HIV. And whereas HIV-related stigma and discrimination can prevent people from getting the treatment and the care needed to strengthen their health and their well-being. And whereas myths and misinformation about HIV-related issues limits people's capacity to make healthier choices, which in fact contributes to the spread of HIV infections. And whereas we recognize the important role within our community of Niagara 
and that it has achieved in achieving the World Health Organization goal of getting to zero. Zero new HIV infections, zero discrimination, zero AIDS related deaths by 2015. Now therefore, I, Mayor Vance M. Badaway, proclaim December 1st, 2014 as World's, World AIDS Day here in the city of Port Colborne. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Bodner. Councillor Butters. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Thank you. I do have three sets of minutes here, and if you don't mind, I'll do them in block. Thank you. The minutes of the Port Coburn Public Library Board meeting dated September 9, 2014. The minutes of the Canal Days Advisory Committee meeting of September 17, 2014. And the minutes of the Port Coburn Transit Advisory Committee meeting dated July 23, 2014. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Steele. Councillor Danch. Quite. <laughs> But he's wanting to fly there, Ron, or something? <laughs> that, was, that was quick. <laughs> Questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Thank you. Are there any notices of motion? Members? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I will be presenting a notice of motion at the next council meeting that deals with uh, seniors' taxations and seeing what kind of measures we can probably, hopefully, suggest to upper levels of government. Great. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Doucette. And you got something else? Go ahead. Well, I was wondering if I could have a leave because I've uh, in 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 the process of doing what I did today, I just noticed something going back to our city website, and and I thought maybe if I could have a leave to present that and see if everyone agrees, and then go from there. But it is out, and I know if it, the answer is no, the answer is no. But I'll just present it next time. But. Uh, I was just wondering if that was possible. What are you talking about? I'm talking about putting a link to um, to the news in Port Coburn and Wayfleet on our city site. We already have one that is already on there for Erie Media. I, I, believe, uh, we, I believe we have one on there for Heidi as well. I looked and I didn't see it, and that was the reason why I was looking at it. I'll take another look again to you make sure. Both, consider it done. I'll, okay. make, I'll make sure I follow it up, okay. up on it tomorrow. There we go. No need for staff direction like that. I'll just, I'll just, just simply wondering. do it. Okay? Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, members of council, no further notice of the motion. With that, I'll move on to the clerk to introduce the bylaws, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That the following bylaws be read three times and finally passed. Bylaw 61451114 being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 11509781 respecting part lot 32, concession 2, geographic township of Humberston in the city of Port Colborne. Regional Municipality of Niagara, municipally known as 650 Barrick Road. Bylaw 61461214, being a bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 11509781, respecting lands legally known as part lot 8, concession 5, Township of Humberston, now in the city of Port Colborne. Regional Municipality of Niagara, located on the east side of Brookfield Road. Bylaw 61471314, being a bylaw to authorize entering into an agreement of purchase and sale respecting 80 Nickel Street and Lot 26 on Plan 857. Bylaw 61481414, being a bylaw to authorize entering into an agreement of purchase and sale respecting Part 44 on Plan 59R3863, except Parts 2 and 3 on Plan 59R13616. Bylaw 61491514, being a bylaw to temporarily close sections of various streets for purposes of the 2014 Santa Claus Parade. Bylaw 61501614, being a bylaw to appoint the named Blue Knight security employee as a bylaw enforcement officer. Bylaw 61511714, being a bylaw to authorize entering into contract agreements with various service providers for the purposes of the Canal Days Marine Heritage Festival. And finally, bylaw 61521814, being a bylaw to authorize entering into a contract agreement with Dr. Alan Daniel respecting the maintenance of a family health organization. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, just on that last bylaw, folks, uh, you may not have read in the paper yet, because I'm not sure if they're going to print it or not. However, we did attract a new doctor to the city of Port we, we did attract Dr. Alan Daniels. Uh, BNI signed. His contract last Thursday, B. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and and kudos goes to uh, Joanne. to Joanne, and, and quite frankly, a long effort, because I had met with Dr. Daniels back in 2001 in Calgary, 
to bring him to Port Colbert. And, and, and he agreed. However, in his travels, he got sort of poached by uh, the NHS to be a hospitalist at the Welland Hospital. And although he moved to Port Colborne, worked out of the Welland Hospital, and then just most recently, I believe, be correct me if I'm wrong, Joseph Brandt, uh, he's worked at, just a great guy, great hospital, or a great uh, doctor, uh, and now is going to be working, uh, taking over Dr. Remington's practice over at Mapleview. So uh, great job by all, uh, new doc in town, and uh, not only is he going to take over Dr. Remington's practice, but I'm hearing that uh, he might take a bit more on too. So for you folks that are looking for a doc, um, by all means, give City Hall a call and get your name on that list if it's not already, not already on the list. And then therefore, uh, we can possibly get you hooked up with uh, either Dr. Daniels or a few of the other docs that, uh, that are in town and that we're trying to attract to the City of Port Colborne. So uh, with that, the bylaws are presented, members of council. I need a motion. Councilor Butters. Well, when we had our meeting, he remembered a conversation he had with Vance <laughs> four years ago when they went out west for, what did you just go for? It was for? longer than that. It was, back, yeah. it was back when we were banned for the F FCM conference. Yes, yes. FCM. What I did was I flew into Calgary, and then before I drove over to Banff for the FCM conference, I actually took a detour down on the north side of Calgary to meet with Dr. Daniels at his practice there to try right. him down here. But that's okay. And, but that's but just, no, that's but, my job. But <laughs> He, for, you know, it's a commendable too that uh, yeah. you remember that one. No, it was all of us. We got to take credit. credit, 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 credit. <laughs> it was a team effort. Everybody deserves credit. Anyway, uh, with that, members, I do have a motion uh, moved by Councilor Butters and seconded by Councilor Kenny that uh, that we accept these bylaws. Questions or comments further? All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Madam Clerk, the confirmatory bylaw, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, that the following bylaw be read three times and finally passed. Bylaw 61531914 being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the proceedings of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Fort Colborne at a special and regular meeting of November 10, 2014. Thank you. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Bodner, Councillor Danch, are there any questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That will be carried. Before I ask for a motion to adjourn, our next meeting, and it will be the last meeting of this Council, is November 24th, 2014. Uh, here in the chamber, 6.30 p.m., Committee of the Whole and Council. And uh, for all those people that are interested, come on out. You can throw things at us or you can... <laughs> 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 or you can see us off. Uh, following that uh, is, is the inaugural meeting. Uh, the inaugural meeting is Monday, December 1st, 2014. And everybody and anybody in the city is welcome to attend. <laughs> <laughs> It is. <laughs> I just figured I get. I know Nancy. I'm gonna be hearing this tomorrow from Nancy, and probably from Matt, Ashley too. <laughs> but Monday, December 1st, 2014, is the inaugural meeting of your new council, and uh, and with that, uh, I'm sure uh, members of the public as well as the former council, especially Bill and I, do welcome uh, the opportunity to both congratulate and as well welcome the new council on board to uh, to take on the baton and uh, lead the community well into the future. So with that, I will now ask for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Steele? I'm sorry, Councillor Danch. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't mess up our tradition here. Councillor Danch, Councillor Steele. Questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That would be carried. Have a wonderful week. <laughs> <laughs>